Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Mrs. Graves? Mrs. Graves? Okay. We'll come back to her. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Okay. Mrs. Graves, are you back with us? Her audio isn't there or oh, her video. Okay. We'll okay, we'll come back. We'll. The, he, Mr. Bull, he might, Ken, Ken may Bull. need to unmute her because she probably came in as a panelist or that special one. So sometimes that happens to me. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Ken, Ken can unmute her. Someone there. Yeah, they, they may be still controlling the camera and the sound because they She's did it to me just a few minutes now. ago. So. One moment, please. She's not here. She'll be calling in later. Okay. Okay, we'll just proceed. Uh, we'll call Mrs. Grace when she's able to log on. Uh, Dr. Alexander? Aye. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bender? Mr. Bender, yes. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. Um, we're, we're here in our uh, informal work session. Uh, this evening, Mayor, we have quite a few uh, guests that are here to present to talk to you about reopening Norfolk. Uh, to start with, we have um, discussion about the Confederate statue. Um, Mr. Bernard Pishko would lead that for us, followed by Dr. Dimitri Lindsay, who is a State Health Department. She's here to provide an update on COVID-19, contract tracing, testing, and enforcement of the go governor's orders followed by Mel Price, who's with Work Program Architects. She'll talk to us about Open Norfolk and the programs, the guidelines, implementation, and the phases for reopening. We have Jared Chalk that will engage us about small business assistance, followed by a, a joint presentation between Mike Goldsmith, our Deputy City Manager, and Mr. Pete Burek. They'll provide information on living and working with COVID-19. They will introduce some guiding principles and discuss how we can best mitigate our risk for our staff and public, which uh, continuing to provide services to our communities. Uh, we have Megan Irwin from our budget office. She's uh, helped us with the Coronavirus Stimulus Task Force and provide a summary of eligible expenses and stimulus funding. And then um, concluding with our libraries director, our recreation parks and open director, and our um, uh, manager at Slover, that's Sonal Rostogi, Daryl Crittenden, and Lynn Clements. Mr. Mayor, if, if possible, I may move Ms. Irwin up into uh, just behind Ms. Mel Price, if you're open to that. That'd be fine, sir. You may continue. With that, I'd ask uh, Mr. Pr Mr. Pishko to engage us about the Confederate Monument. Uh, thank you. Um, you all know the good news that the General Assembly uh, unshackled us a little bit, and our local delegation were, um, included sponsors that enable us to uh, now know that it's legal to uh, 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 deal with the monument. The legislation becomes uh, effective July the 1st. Um, it requires a, uh, a public hearing. Uh, the notice of the public hearing should include our intent, so hopefully we can discuss that tonight. The last time you discussed it, you, uh, I believe, um, wanted to relocate it to the uh, Elmwood Cemetery. So if you could confirm that tonight or make other plans, we could prepare a notice of a public hearing, which we should be able to get in the newspaper and have the public hearing on July the 7th, if that was agreeable to you. The statute then, rather curiously, requires us to um, uh, offer museums, battlefields, and the like uh, an opportunity to make a proposal to us about its use or disposition 
Um, no proposals are required to be accepted by us, but the statute would have us wait 30 days uh, after the public hearing before the um, action, demolition, relocation took place. So that's a summary of the legislation, and if you uh, advise us how you'd like to proceed, we will do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mishko. Ms. Mishko, I think you summarized how we would like you to proceed uh, to uh, follow the legislation that uh, which requires the, 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 the council action on July the 7th or immediately after our reorganization uh, and then uh, advertise the monument to be taken by a museum or a cemetery, a battlefield, or Daughters of the Confederacy, or some other organization who would like to take receipt of it. Uh, and then uh, shortly after, we will proceed uh, with the, uh, with the uh, relocation or the transfer or the acquisition, uh, whatever uh, comes out of the advertising it, or if nothing comes out of it, uh, then the council will take the next step to relocate it to Elmwood Cemetery. Thank you. Okay, what's next? Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lindsay. She doesn't necessarily need an introduction. She's been before you and your peers previously. I, I will say that um, during this time, she's been especially um, available and, and, uh, and with us, with Team Norfolk. Uh, it, it, I begin my week and end my week with her, and so it, it's, uh, it's special that she takes this time um, during this, uh, this curious, curious environment that we're in. So I'm very proud and, and happy to introduce uh, Dr. Demetri Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of uh, City Council. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm happy to um, be here to present you with updates on the coronavirus uh, pandemic outbreak that we are experiencing. I'd like to talk a bit about contact investigations to begin with. So I wanted to, um, do, do I? You were just speaking, saying next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, so here I have a, a tracing that just sort of walks through the process that we use for contact investigation. And it is part of a broader um, process that begins actually with case investigation and then contact tracing. We've been doing this in public health in Virginia for many, many years. I understand and it's become come to light uh, during this pandemic that for many states, as a result of decreases in funding, they may have gotten away from this practice. But we feel that this is core to public health practice and in ensuring our communities are safe. So we've never deviated from this. Uh, we do it all the time for uh, tuberculosis and other communicable diseases, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, it is something that our, our staff are very skilled at and do on a regular basis. So we begin this process actually with case investigation of individuals who have been uh, confirmed to have uh, positive uh, evidence of infection. And it is a key strategy for preventing the spread of COVID-19. Uh, once what is, has been identified as having um, a communicable infection so, such as COVID-19, we reach out to that individual and uh, contact them uh, and initiate uh, an interview process that's fairly open-ended to get an understanding of uh, their experience with the infection, their symptoms, uh, when those symptoms may have started, and also um, going from there to identifying the activities during their infectious period that may point to individuals who may have been exposed to them and also be at risk of acquiring the infection. That uh, process uh, helps us identify those individuals that we may now reach out to uh, for a contact, uh, for contact inv investigation. So um, we um, start with that list of the most likely individuals to be exposed are those in closest contact with the individual, such as household contacts or those who may be in very close contact for long periods of time. Um, we sequentially um, um, identify those individuals 
and began a, an interview with each of them going through the same process, understanding um, their potential exposure uh, in the at-risk situation that we've identified and also uh, checking for symptoms. Uh, in both cases, for the case investigation and the contact tracing, we, are, we ensure that the individuals are practicing uh, the proper procedure for staying away from others um, so that they do not uh, potentially infect anyone else. Um, we, again, in the contact tracing, check for symptoms and, and also um, ensure that they understand and know what practices they may need to take in order to stay safe, to understand whether or not the, um, the uh, setting in their household allows them to separate from others, and whether or not they have needs and resources. We actually do, uh, for these investigations, for COVID, uh, pull together kits that give them supplies that they may need. We want to make sure that they have a medical uh, physician uh, who will be able to take care of them if they should have uh, issues or complications, and that they know what to do if such issues arise. So that process just cascades from identifying someone who may have infection, uh, understanding the disease course and potential people who may be at risk, um, interviewing those, uh, monitoring both to ensure that they stay in compliance uh, with staying away from others, isolation for the infected, quarantine for those who may have been exposed, and if they develop symptoms, that uh, individual becomes a new case, and we go from there to doing contact investigation of individuals who may have been exposed to them. Um, the third part of that process that I've alluded to is monitoring to ensure compliance, and we have staff who follow up on a regular basis to ensure that that person remains uh, isolated or quarantined until such time that we feel uh, that they are no longer a risk to the general public. This process takes a lot of skill. It involves people understanding or those uh, staff understanding confidentiality, knowledge of the disease process and when someone would be infectious, as well as um, the proper procedures uh, to ensure safety and preventive strategies. So. Um, these are very skilled people who have lots of experience and we uh, are very comfortable with the work that they do. I want to move on now to the next process to talk about and we've had a lot of questions about testing. Um, currently we have two different types of tests. One is a test for a nuclear test and the second one is an antibody test. So the first uh, the nuclear test is called PCR, and um, that stands for uh, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. It is a test that looks for the nu uh, nu nuclear material uh, of the virus to determine that someone is actually currently infected. This is the gold standard for testing for COVID-19 at this time. Um, the test uh, involves collecting a small sample using uh, basically what is a long Q-tip, if we could go back, um, collected in the nasal pharynx, and that is transported to the lab where that material is, is used to extract the virus, um, the RNA or the genetic material for the virus. It is converted to DNA material, which is the type of um, genetic material in humans, and then from there we amplify it to a volume where it can be detected in the lab. Um, that does point to current infection. The antibody test, uh, on the other hand, is a test that is used to detect the immune response um, to the virus in the system. So we're looking for antibodies to tell us that someone may have been infected and now they're reacting by having an immune response. Um, what you see on the slide is sort of a uh, depiction of how the antibody, the body responds to infection, and we develop uh, different types of antibodies, but here what you're seeing is uh, a 
depiction of when IgM starts to rise, which is an early detect indicator of infection, and then IgG, which comes on later and usually lasts longer. This test is relatively new. There are lots of them uh, available uh, commercially or being investigated commercially by the Centers for Disease Control. The limitation is we really don't know with certainty exactly what a positive test means at this point. We do know that um, individuals who are infected with COVID-19 develop an immune response, uh, but it is not clear at this time how much of a protection that immune response offers. So if someone has positive antibodies, we don't know if they're protected from future infection. We also don't know exactly if um, it does offer protection, how long that protection will last. So there's much to be learned about uh, what this uh, test will offer us. What is clear at this point is that it should not be used uh, to assume that someone is safe to return to work or other settings. Uh, we still follow the PCR and also uh, symptoms. Basically, uh, our decision about safety to return to work is based on recommendations from the CDC regarding resolution of symptoms. Finally, I want to talk briefly about enforcement of the governor's executive orders. Um, under uh, the local environmental health division of the health department, is responsible for ensuring um, compliance with regulations uh, that we, we regulate under our um, Code of Virginia orders. And those basically involve regulations of food establishments. For other non-regulated complaints related to the Governor's Executive Order 63, uh, those uh, call, those complaints should be forwarded to the state call center. Regarding uh, the regulations at the local level, our focus is on education. Uh, we focus on disseminating information uh, via our website, our call center, working with other city departments that may also regulate these entities, and direct contact with the establishments. We have established a food uh, establishment survey that we're conducting by phone, and uh, we are issuing those questions to, uh, to gauge compliance remotely. We also follow progressive enforcement uh, policy, uh, looking at uh, investigating complaints, education, and then for repeat violations, uh, there's the potential for permit suspension. And our success is very contingent on working with our partners, the City of Norfolk, uh, ABC, and also business associations. So, so finally, I wanted to bring attention to everyone that we are in the middle of a pandemic of unprecedented proportions and impact. Many unknowns are and will continue to unfold. As we move forward cautiously with reopening society, we are all dependent upon each other in safely navigating these next steps. What each of us does is important. The timing has begun to intersect with key historic events in our community and our expression of who we are as a society. For members of the community who are moved to take an active role, I am asking that you also make a conscious effort to take the necessary public health precautions to protect those yourself and those you love. If you engage in large public gatherings, try to keep a social distance of at least six feet, if possible, and be certain at all times to wear a face covering or face shield that can also protect the eyes. These activities are particularly uh, effective opportunities for spread of infection. Uh, chances um, in these settings are much higher for encountering someone with infection who may or may not be aware that they have the infection. If you have symptoms suggestive of coronavirus infection, stay away to avoid infecting others. In summary, for those who participate, please be safe and take steps to protect uh, 
those you love by following public health practices. Following the event, monitor symptoms, exercise caution around those who may be at high risk, and seek medical attention if needed. For testing opportunities or more information, you can contact the health department or your physician. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Are there any questions or comments for Dr. Lindsay? This is Brother Riddick. I have a question. Yes, yes. Mr. Riddick. Yeah. Dr. Lindsay. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was listening to the governor's presentation today, and he said something about reopening swimming pools. Do you have any thoughts on that or on how we could open ours and be safe? Well, I think um, there, there are steps that we could talk about um, at length, and we have been, as a health department, working with the city departments to discuss and review their plans, and we're happy to, to do that uh, specifically for the issue of swimming pools. I think there are lots of different factors that would come into consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. Grace. Um, so I've seen other cities and localities have testing events, and my understanding is that the testing events that we host in Norfolk have to be sanctioned by the health department. So if a group or an organization wanted to sanction a free testing event to help people get tested, how would they go about doing that? Uh, we're happy to, to work with anyone to, to help them uh, plan for a testing event. I might add that we are working in partnership with many in the community now uh, to sponsor testing events. We've been uh, working with uh, the local pastors in communities, particularly in areas where people may not have access to other resources for testing. We've also been working in partnership with Sentara Hospital and uh, we'll be working with a number of private labs and we have even uh, we are also working with employers to also ensure that they have an opportunity for testing so um, we're happy to work with with anyone um, if any individuals have questions about testing opportunities and we are doing them in the community now uh, we're we're happy to um, answer those questions they can also call our call center um, and uh, we actually will be, we are planning for some in, in various communities around the city, and we will also be doing an at-large one in the next few weeks. Thank you. Mr. M Mr. Mayor, I have a yes. question, please. Ms. Johnson for, for Dr. Lindsay. Um, hi, Dr. Lindsay. Thank Hello. you for everything that you're doing for the city of Norfolk and beyond. My question is for the contact tracing. Um, I know that it was projected that for the state of Virginia that we would probably need, and my numbers may be incorrect, so please correct me, approximately 2,000 contact tracers, and for the, the city of Norfolk, anywhere from 100 to 125 con um, contact tracers needed. So in speaking with... Um, my city manager, um, Mr. Chip Fowler, um, I suggested to him that because the Workforce Council has many um, resources that um, the Workforce Council could be a great resource for, for you and the city of Norfolk um, as far as getting those um, people needed for contact tracing. And so the Workforce Council um, along with representatives from the city of Norfolk will be reaching out to you to see how we could possibly um, partner. Um, the goal is to take some of those medical students who are in need of internships and who really want to be boots on the ground for our city um, during the summer to possibly partner up with you and city um, officials and the Workforce Council to make that happen. So okay. the, uh, thank you for, for those suggestions. 
Uh, I will add that many of those things are already uh, moving now. Uh, we have had a very large response with our Medical Reserve Corps, with people volunteering since uh, this pandemic started. And that does include many medical students and, and other uh, public health students from the School of Public Health and other areas, uh, as, also, as well as people from the general public. We've been in discussion with the city as well regarding potential staff that may no longer be working or may have been furloughed to see yeah. if there may be opportunities there. And uh, my business manager is, is currently in dialogue with human resources looking for opportunities. I went through some of the skill sets that we need for case investigators and contact tracers. So those are fairly specific uh, skills um, the, and experience uh, that we're looking for with those positions. That process has also been centralized uh, and applying for those positions is at the state, off, state level at this point. We have also already started hiring and started training throughout the state for those positions, but it is still open for us to try to see if, uh, if there are people who are identified who have skills, they can be referred to apply. That said, we're also looking at other opportunities like our community testing and some of the specialized things that we're doing, working with industries and the departments to look at how to safely plan to come back on board. Uh, so we're looking at maybe there are skill sets there that have not been recognized that we could also use. So we'll keep working on that. We realize that that's an important issue for the city and for people who may have lost their uh, positions, and we want to help as much as we can. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? or issues or concerns or comments for Dr. Lindsay? If, if not, thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Thank you. Mr. Binda. Yes, sir, uh, thank you. Um, the, the good news, uh, this next presenter, she's, she's on with you. You can see her virtually there. Um, I want to say, uh, while she's unmuting her mic, uh, a big thank you to you and uh, City Council for how flexible and, uh, and fast you've been in, in working with Open Norfolk. It's required us to work across the, the state ABC, the health department, obviously WPA and Mal and, and city planning staff and transit and public works. It's just a myriad of people, but um, Mayor, you were in City Council being open to us moving fast quickly, understanding that we might make some changes that people are inquisitive about, but all with the idea that we're trying to do our best to ensure as many businesses can thrive in this interesting environment. And so um, just know that at the state level, it's being recognized. And then Mel will probably also share that we've gotten contacts from Connecticut and, and other states about what we're doing with Open Norfolk. So I won't steal too much more of her thunder, but I'll turn it over to Mel Price. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mayor and members of council. Um, I will share my presentation and let's see, just a second, of course it is, let me see, one second, I think I was, it is not, here we go, perfect. And I just want to make sure you're able to see that clearly. Good? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to really do two things tonight. One, just provide you with an update on the Open Norfolk program. And then two, have an open discussion about the next steps moving forward and really hear from you all um, and have you tell us where you'd like Open Norfolk to go. So quick report out. The purpose of Open Norfolk was really to bring the city together. Um, the governor allowed us to reopen and people were going to reopen and we wanted to ensure that it was done in a healthy way um, to, to make for healthy businesses, to provide healthy ways of, of getting places and creating space. We provided quick build assistance, we made guidelines, posters and helped with the reopening plans. 
I just updated this number uh, while we were on the call. Um, as of as of today, 312 plus uh, small businesses have been reached directly on foot, door to door, um, and we're really proud of that. From what we can tell, we've been scouring national news. There is not another city in the country that has done this. So I'm really proud to be a part of this team. And I think the city should be really proud to have gone door to door to our small businesses. Um, we have reached people, this is Eric at Easy Inn. Uh, we've reached people on site. Uh, we've particularly focused on areas that are not well connected where you can't just go next door and, and ask how your neighbor next door is opening things. We've met with business owners on site. We've measured the streets. We've adapted quickly, and we've worked with all of the departments at the city as well as the health department and ABC. So this is all temporary, but we wanted to do these temporary measures in a safe way. We've adapted spaces for outside dining in minutes, where we've 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 marked things off, we've texted our health department and ABC inspector to give a thumbs up and moved on so that people could reopen safely. Uh, we've provided additional resources for those most impacted and in need of more space, um, especially in a historic city where we have at times narrow sidewalks, we've built space um, for, for restaurants and small businesses that needed it. Over 20,000 square feet of parklets have been built throughout the entire city. And so we just wanted to go through the why, the what, the how, the who, the timeline, and just make sure that um, everyone is aware of the program and we're able to reach anyone who's not had access to it. Um, so we wanted to meet the challenges of reopening during a pandemic. And we really wanted to address social isolation of vulnerable neighbors and, and businesses who may not have um, Heard all of the rules or understood the rules. Open Norfolk is hosted on the city's website. It's a one stop shop and it has downloadable toolkits. So on the city's website, you can actually just sign up. You can tell us your name, your restaurant, your phone number. It immediately sends us an email and we call restaurants and small businesses within an hour, get back to them and see what their needs are. That feeds into a spreadsheet the whole team of volunteers are seeing. So who is Open Norfolk? It is, it is really the whole city. It is the Department of Health. It is the ABC. Um, it is our team, including um, national consultants, the best of the best in the country who we were lucky to have um, come to Norfolk. The Downtown Norfolk Council has been instrumental. And then our volunteers at 757 Makerspace the Young Architects Forum, shout out to the young designers who've been helping us um, and really just volunteers from residents around the city. So it's all of us. Um, so how did it happen? It's important that we, to let you know that we studied national and international best practices, areas that were affected by COVID before Norfolk was. Uh, we studied the National Association of Trans City Transportation Officials, they wrote a manual um, for transforming streets for pandemic response and recovery. But it's important to note that it came out after we started Open Norfolk. So we really um, uh, broke some new ground and then checked our work against the national standards. It required proactive communication between city departments and then rapid testing and implementation. So I think the timeline is important. Um, on May 11th, the idea was pitched and it was approved by the city manager's office, which is incredible. Uh, the following day, we met with the Department of Health and ABC. On the 13th, we coordinated with the Norfolk Safe and Strong Committee. And on the 14th, Virginia ABC released regulations at 1 p.m. We wrote the guidelines and they were posted to the city's website within four hours. The website went live and restaurants started reaching out to us at 10 p.m. at night. We stayed on the phone with them until 1 a.m. as they moved their tables and chairs outside to prepare for the next day of reopening. Uh, that same day, our, our national partners um, had been driving here from Dallas, Texas, and they arrived and our build team began. Um, so we, within the first week, we reached boots on the ground, over 100 individual businesses, and we went all over the city. So where did it happen? Absolutely everywhere. We mapped every commercial 
um, property and district, and we drove there and we walked there. Uh, we had some really strong equity object objectives in the very beginning, and we wanted to make sure we prioritized those businesses and we got them first in line. Um, and we wanted this all to be safe and fun and, and healthy for everyone. So here's what it looks like. This is a three page downloadable guideline. So while we've been on this call, you've probably seen that the phase two, uh, the governor's safe at home phase two regulations came out. I've had a chance to read those, but we digested those and Virginia ABC and the Department of Health's regulations into three pages because it's hard for folks to read 60 pages of, of information and then implement. And so we had this approved by the city's attorney, city attorney's office, ABC and the health department. And these were our guidelines. We did 3D, quick 3D renderings and made sure that everything was clear and understandable. So it might be the first time the city has ever hosted a open Norfolk branded uh, Pinterest board for folks to DIY and do it themselves. And we gave them hundreds of ideas um, to implement on their own. We designed custom signage, and this was handed out to every single restaurant that we were able to reach um, if they were open in the city. Uh, we've been driving back, delivering it to folks who weren't open. And we had those printed in Spanish um, and Mandarin Chinese as well. So those have been a, a real hit and people really appreciated um, having those signs in multiple languages. Uh, we provided clear um, places for to go pick up zones and try to get our streets organized. And uh, something you may have noticed if you have come downtown is that in our more dense areas like downtown and our commercial corridors, dining started to take over parking spaces, which meant there were a lot of parking spaces removed. And so downtown, we added over 161 free parking spaces to help offset that need. And uh, an amazing good thing for the city happened, which was our speed slowed down. We were out there with radar guns from an average of 47 miles per hour to 27 miles per hour, knowing that the maximum speed limit on Bush Street is 25. So that was that was a good co-benefit. And then there was a multi-use path added. So. Uh, the north downside was professionally striped yesterday, and we we started on the southbound side, and then the winds picked up, so that should be finished tomorrow. Um, and we had some signage that is being installed to alert folks. We had a stencil campaign that was really run by our amazing core of volunteers, and thank you to all of you who volunteered. Um, to just make people generally more aware of doing their part and staying six feet apart. And these were stenciled throughout the city. We received some good press locally in the Virginia pilot, uh, channel 13, news channel three, and then nationally, um, the American Society of Landscape Architects, um, the American Planning Association, we will be presenting at the Congress of New Urbanism. And then I believe planning will present at the American Institute of Architects National Conference. So as Winter said, uh, we have heard from cities in Texas, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and others wanting to know how Norfolk was able to do this so quickly. So that's a good thing. Uh, metrics. We know that collecting information is incredibly important. To date, we've received over 1,200 responses from restaurants and, and folks who have visited restaurants and have experienced this program. So we're getting some good data to feed into the next phase. And I just wanted to show you a few photos of implementation of our team out in the streets, building park lifts, uh, installing park lifts, delivering park lifts. Um, so this is Croker Spot on 35th Street, Suite 1200 in the Neon District, also in the Neon District, um, downtown to the left, um, Freemason neighborhood and over in Chelsea on the right. Uh, Sunset Grill uh, in Lambert's Point, Cutter's Kitchen on 35th Street, um, Vegan Planet Cafe, and um, Senses Vegan on Church Street, and the restaurant owners have just been incredible. Streets on the left, Stockpot and Downtown on the right. Um, we even had folks celebrate their weddings in front of um, custom social distancing signs. 
Uh, this past Sunday, I had the opportunity to uh, walk with these uh, wonderful women on the left, Shirley um, and Dr. Hage Dorn and Olson, the service dog. And we did a little evaluation um, to see how accessible this was. We know that we need to make some adjustments to create a zero curb at all parklets. And then we talked about any of this that might carry on to be any sort of long-term strategy. It actually be a tool to improve mobility on our narrow historic streets. So as we move dining out, all of a sudden we have some more space on the sidewalk so that you can walk side by side with a friend um, in a wheelchair. So this is my spreadsheet, and many of you have been copied on this. So you can track our progress hour by hour as we move throughout the city. Highlighted columns are items where we go back and, and folks need our additional assistance. We've been part of the enforcement team, but it's been, um, hold on one second. It's been friendly, gentle enforcement. Um, we know that our business owners are adjusting and learning new things. And so we've worked really well together to enforce um, the regulation. We've had volunteers come out all over the city and thank you so much to city staff and residents who have volunteered with us. Um, we covered every ward and we, we walked every, every inch. I did wanna share some testimonials with you. It's it's wonderful to get feedback on the spot. And I wanted to read two of them. One is from Eric, the owner of Easy Inn. And he said, I wanted to thank you for all the help we received from you and your team. My family has been struggling with running our restaurant in the wake of the virus. Your kindness has helped us to see a brighter future. And then at the top, um, Mr. Earl Fraley, the chair of our city planning commission, it's delightful to see our city responding so ingeniously and innovatively to these circumstances. Planning Commission is ready to assist and accommodate the needs of the citizens and the businesses who help our city thrive. So um, I know you have a copy of the presentation and you can read some of the other words. So we really wanted to talk to you about what's next in planning for reopening phases two and three. And we've all just received the phase two guidelines while we were sitting here together. And I wanted to talk about what we've heard, and that's that not every person or business is in this, sitting in the same place in terms of comfort level. Uh, we, we found that business owners were scared. They were scared um, about the financial situation, but they were scared about health and their, uh, their employees' health and their customers' health. And so we were brainstorming about what if we gave uh, business owners a choice and communicated clearly and developed a system that allowed um, the city of Norfolk to kind of ebb and flow with the governor's orders and their own individual comfort levels. So uh, we may be moving into phase two tomorrow, but some of our businesses may feel like they want to stay in phase one. So this was an idea for a color-coded system that allowed businesses to clearly communicate with their customers where they were as a business. So it's just an idea. Um, I wanted to get some feedback on that, as well as just a couple of other ideas, and then we'll come back. Um, also wanted to think about how have we, are there some lessons learned from this program that can translate into some wonderful summer programming? Um, NACTO has published School Street and Open Play Street, and it made us start to think about doing a case or a case study. And I know that you all now have received a letter um, from Deirdre Love, who runs Teens with a Purpose. And we thought that having the Open Norfolk team work with Teens with a Purpose could be a really wonderful prototype. Um, generally, there's over 100 youth from surrounding neighborhoods, priority given to St. Paul's area for children who receive free or reduced lunch. Um, this would typically, the programming happens indoors. We understand that they'll be able to operate at about 50% capacity. They really want to be able to move outside um, and be safe and feel safe. And we could work together to develop some light construction skills. Um, so we thought about that proposal and we'd love to work together um, to develop some programming and to build some things and work, and work uh, through this proposal and implement some different things. And that made us think about 
what's happening all over the city with our recreation centers. And you see highlighted in green, the rec centers that uh, will begin to reopen when they can. And in red, those that will um, remain closed temporarily due to budget restrictions. So could the Open Norfolk team, RPOS, Fest Events, DNC, and our arts organizations pair together to help fill in some of the gaps in the city? And if you think that's a good idea, where would you like us to do that? Um, we could do that in many ways. Passive parks could have people enjoying them. We could start to pair with arts organizations that can't operate in their facilities in phase two, bring them outside, um, really turn our cultural buildings and social spaces inside out. So all of that great programming that happens inside, let's bring it outdoors. Uh, we thought about things about um, go on five bike rides and there could be an ice cream social in the park. Uh, learn to work on a bike to possibly um, earn a bike. Um, so you've seen images like this all over the country and Fest events and RPUS are actively planning for some um, concepts for phase two reopening in public spaces. And they have gone through and already begun to plan for these social circles, plan for Ocean View Park, as well as Town Point Park and Town Bank Fountain Park. And they're offering to really bring this programming throughout the whole city. And so pull our resources and work for, for the, the greater good of the whole city. And so this could start to look like farmers markets and a little bit of entertainment and parking lots. We could start to reimagine and, and the um, governor's um, guidelines address drive-in movie theaters. We could imagine this on the top deck of MacArthur um, Center um, as a way to support local restaurants. You buy your movie ticket, you pull up, and you get some food delivered to your, to your car from one of our local businesses. Um, so th those are just a few ideas and would just like to talk to you about um, phase two and anything you'd like us to do. Good. Okay. Thank you, Mel, very much. Uh, this is exciting. And thank you for your leadership. Yes, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, Andrea's applauding. We all are applauding you, Mel, and your team. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank council members for uh, you know, assisting and giving you suggestions and recommendations. A lot of things that all of us talked about, we see uh, those things in the slides. So thank you for listening. And more importantly, listening to the businesses. Uh, in the city of Norfolk and accommodating them so they can continue to get uh, open and, and to thrive. Uh, any questions, comments, or remarks for, for Mel? Andrea. Uh, great job, Mel. Uh, for, you guys have just worked tirelessly. I really appreciate that. Um, and you mentioned phase two, or, and, and, I'm, and I know you said that there's, you, you know, are we going to go back into those 312 businesses? Are we, are you checking out their spaces inside as well? Or how's that going to work? Um, I think we're to some extent really waiting for, um, so I've thrown out some proposals, but we really need direction from you and the city manager's office. Um, Open Norfolk was an idea that came together really quickly and we're looking for to hear from you where you want it to go next. So we're we're here and ready to to do what you need us to do. Okay. I I would, Mr. Mayor, I just think we have to. We've done such a great job with phase one. I would hope there's some consistency moving into phase two and some follow on with the, with um, the restaurants. I yes. think opening inside is going to be really, I don't know, it's going to be odd. Yes, uh, I I believe uh, that we are uh, working directly with uh, the governor and his team. And uh, they have reached out to us and we've reached out to them. And Mel uh, certainly will uh, share with uh, the governor and his team some of the ideas that she and her team uh, have developed. And I think that it's exciting and we can do a good job in phase two reopening as well. Um, I'm confident that we can. Uh, Mel has shared with me some of the thoughts and ideas that she, uh, she has and they, they, they work, and not only do they work for Norfolk, uh, I think they are scalable, I think they are portable and transferable. And I think that's what's exciting about what the work that we're doing here in Norfolk. And when, you have, when you have cities in, uh, in Texas and Connecticut, Massachusetts calling, calling Norfolk uh, and inquiring uh, about how we are reopening Norfolk, 
in a smart way, in a sensible way, uh, that's, wor that, that's working co collaboratively exactly with the businesses. Uh, that's exciting. And, and national organizations are calling us as well. Yes, Courtney. So Mel, thanks very much. I think we should keep the momentum going and I would love to see a lot of the measures that we've already put in place for phase one to stay in place. I think some of the ideas are sustainable for the long term outside of the, pan the pandemic and the economic crisis. I think it just demonstrates how progressive Norfolk is and I'm thankful to my city colleagues on council who basically just said, run, you know, don't, don't even crawl or walk, just run to Mel and her team and make it all happen. So Mel, we encourage you to continue to be innovative and creative and help these businesses succeed because they're the lifeblood of our city. So whatever we can do to support you, I encourage you to reach out to us and say, hey, I need, I need, I need, so that we can say yes, seriously. And I think that really we're a great model and I'm proud of what the city has done and what you have done with your team. So I think we need to keep the momentum going. This is gonna be, you know, a long time before who knows what the next phase will look like and when that will happen. So thank you very much, Mel. Yes, Ms. Graves. So I want to say thank you for taking the Teens with a Purpose plan um, and running with that. I know that Deidre was very concerned and not only concerned, but she took that concern and that energy and she put it into a proposal and a plan. And so I want to thank you for working with her. I think that is indeed a model, along with all of the other things, but it's definitely a model for organizations that work with young people and um, in, in small spaces to be able to use and, and that other uh, localities can model, you know, they can use what we've done, no need for them to reinvent the wheel. The last thing I want to do is re- iterate my objection to the bike lane on 35th street because we're taking up some sides of the streets for parking and we're doing things innovatively i really 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 think we need to look at that bike lane on 35th street because if there's an emergency if there's an emergency um, a fire or ems or anything of that nature or an accident even um it putting that bike lane down 35th street makes it very very difficult um on a on a good day and so now with all of the modifications that we have that may stay in place i agree with courtney keeping those things in place possibly after the COVID-19 pandemic is over because they make for great meeting spaces. Um, I really think we need to take a look at that bike lane and um, consider giving it back to traffic flow. Mr. Mayor. That's all I got. Mr. Smigel, you have the floor. Mr. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Mel, and for all of our volunteers in the city for uh, doing this. Um, Winter and staff, I sent an email to you about the VML Local Championship Champion Awards. Uh, VML at our annual conference every year has done innovative, but we changed it to uh, champions. And I think that this uh, project um, would be a great nomination. Uh, there's a different categories. This could fall under, uh, actually I'm looking at it right now, economic and business stability. So I, I encourage us to really write this up and, and get that into VML, you know, by the deadline of August 15th. Uh, just a, a couple uh, questions and uh, points. When my family and I had the opportunity to get out and drive down Granby Street, and uh, all of my family but me went to uh, Paris um, this year, at, or last year, excuse me, and I, I loved uh, my, my middle child, my 10-year-old, as we were driving down Granby Street, and she said, gosh, this looks like Paris. And uh, I, I, I like that feel, and I agree with everybody that if there's a way that we can keep this. I am concerned with the speed on Granby Street. Um, please let me know if I'm breaking up. I, I, you guys are all disappeared, but I, I can still hear myself talk. Um, can you still hear me? We can yes. hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about the speed on Granby Street. I know that there's a, a sign it says uh, 15 miles per hour, but I don't think that everybody's obeying that. Um, and maybe we need some better signage. Uh, as car, I had to pull over uh, a couple times. People were tailgating me 
the speed pass uh, down Grady Street. So um, if we could look into that. And then, Mel, I'm curious to uh, talk to you a little bit more about these bigger events and these pop-ups around the city with Fest events and some mm -hmm. of our partners and those social distancing circles. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looked kind of weird to me, but it's just a reality. How, how many people can fit in those circles? Uh, it was hard to tell based on the map, or is that 10 or less? Are yes. there one person yes. in each of those circles? Those and particular, oh, oh, go ahead, <laughs> sorry. Good. What were you saying? Those particular circles that Fest Events has drawn out in um, with RPOS are, um, I believe, eight foot diameter. They're made to fit four people and um, maybe a dog and picnic in the middle, whatever you'd like to do. And then they are um, six feet apart. So you can do a variety of sizes and they did that before the, the recent guidelines came out. So um, it was just to show capacity. Okay, I, I just, I, I actually like the idea. Um, I think it also would help with what uh, Councilwoman Gray's was saying with, uh, she said earlier uh, in a conversation about people coming together back in large groups, that this is a way to possibly ease people in uh, back into that feeling because there is some uneasiness and uncomfortableness uh, of that. And I, I think this is a, a great way. And I know Mr. Mayor, we had talked about doing um, a large event kind of uh, task force um, I, I don't know if that's something that's still on the table or if you're just comfortable with Mel continuing to work with the larger venues, larger um, event, festive events, um, how we could phase in these bigger events uh, back into our city. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, exactly. We did discuss having a work group for our larger events and festivals. However, uh, I was so impressed with the work that Mel and her team is doing. Uh, we had that conversation with her team, and they believe that they can incorporate uh, addressing the concerns that you and I talked about of accommodating those large groups. And she will certainly uh, work with you and Mr. Binda, uh, who I identified as the two, uh, one on council, one administration that will advise the council. So Mel will work directly with you and Mr. Binda okay. uh, to help the council. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, anyone else uh, would like to address Mel? Okay, Mel, thank you, good seeing you, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. So Mr. Mayor, we um, we hear you loud, loud and clear and the expectation by you and your peers is to, to keep moving. Yeah, I, I think you'll be happy this evening. You'll hear from Daryl, Sonal, and Lynn and many of the tenants that um, Mel shared with you just a minute ago, they're, they're going to uh, incorporate in, the, in their models and also from Michael Goldsmith and Pete Burek about expectations as we move into these phases and how we can, uh, rather than progress, use a kind of a, a coordinated approach so that, um, that there isn't uh, confusion. So I think even tonight you'll get some answers to some of the questions you were posing. I do want to take a, a quick minute, sir, I, in my haste. Dr. Filer obviously is not with us this evening. He was called away in a family matter. Things are well. Um, it's good news. We do miss them, but I thought I'd mention that before uh, we move on to the next piece. Um, uh, next on our agenda is Jared Chalk, who will uh, engage you about small business assistance. Thank you, Mr. Benda. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, glad to be here tonight. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about our um, efforts to um, reach businesses um, and proactively connect with the business community. Um, in addition to what uh, Mel's team is doing and um, what all of our partners are doing. Um, just give us one second, we'll have, pull up the presentation. So uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you know all of our partners, right? This is this is a team effort. It's been a team sport. Um, we've, we're all in this together, and, and we've really tried to to bring a holistic approach to um, dealing with the response and dealing with um, businesses here. You can see there's a lot of partners that we have um, as it relates to business. Um, our city departments um, have been at the forefront of this. City planning, EOC. Um, you know, all of our city departments have been very helpful um, as we've worked through this. Our business assistance campaign um, 
primarily dealt with um, proactively connecting with small businesses. And what, what we said from the beginning is you can um, build relationships in person and you maintain them virtually, right? So we, we proactively wanted to connect with people on the phone. It was hard to meet in person, but we, we, we called them. Um, instead of blasting out email, which we did, we, we wanted to call people. Um, we off wanted to offer immediate business retention solutions. Um, we wanted to identify the at-risk businesses and identify the challenges that they've got going forward. Um, we focused on impacted sectors, our basic industries, and again, remember, basic industries are um, companies that export or, um, a good or service and import dollars into Norfolk. Um, we wanted to be sure that we were inclusive um, and we hit all parts of the city's city. And then we, we looked at commissioner revenue data um, to identify what areas of the city produce the most revenue, whether it's our business parks, our industrial parks, our economic zones, and really wanted to focus in on, on those areas. Um, we've uh, contacted and been in touch with over a thousand business, businesses as of last week. Um, right now, we've got direct services to 354 of those businesses. Um, and 210 businesses are being monitored um, and supported um, that, are, that are very um, impacted. And I'll get into a lot of the data here, here in a second. Um, just a little bit of a business profile. We're, we're talking about, again, um, companies that export a, a good or service. Um, most of these are small businesses under 50 employees. 60% um, are served, uh, of these businesses serve the region. 40% uh, export internationally. Um, one in three of the businesses that we're dealing with um, have in experienced supply chain disruptions due to, to the pandemic. Um, and then 32 of the businesses um, are now producing um, a product or service in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, and then 12 of those um, 1,000 businesses actually have an increase in sales um, uh, due, to the, due to the pandemic. Uh, some of the examples of things that we, we did right from the beginning, um, we, we uh, called m most businesses in the industrial park um, and tried to identify which um, companies could pivot to address PPE concerns. Um, and we, we uh, worked with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, um, the state, to um, connect them with, with companies that could uh, create a product. An, an example being a mattress factory in, in Norfolk. Um, was quickly able to pivot along with another company um, that would um, then uh, treat the, the mattresses and we were able to supply for hospitals um, or, or other organizations that needed them. Um, we connected them to lending institutions, uh, provided access to capital. And then uh, for a while there, we were really um, working closely with um, uh, companies who were going through the EIDL process and the PPP process. So looking to identify um, um, capital, access to capital, and providing them access to capital through the SBA and the Treasury. And how that was rolled out federally, um, you know, there was a lot of mixed messages, um, a lot of challenges there um, as, we, as we worked through that. Um, we've been working on external grants and loans, um, promoting businesses that are open, again, working with um, our resources such as Open Norfolk, and, um, and still getting uh, real estate projects through the project coordination, working with planning. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, the first thing we did months ago, um, we, we began to notice you know, supply chain issues. So before the pandemic even really happened here in Norfolk, I wanna say January, or January February timeframe, uh, we started to notice that companies were having supply chain issues. So we quickly um, uh, repositioned our capital access program. We had a, uh, um, some money for loans um, and we, pivoted that um, loan product to uh, address businesses that had supply chain disruptions. Um, that money has since been loaned out. Um, we also had the economic uh, Norfolk Economic uh, Disaster Business Grant. Um, this is small business grants that, again, we retooled money that we had already. Um, we have two rounds. Um, the first round has been tapped. Um, the second round opens June 12th. Um, and these are small grants, $2,000 grants, for companies that are looking to reopen and need um, things such as plexiglass, um, additional sanitizing stations, things that will assist them with the reopening effort. Um, you know, if you think about a business, especially a restaurant or, or um, hotel, they're opening with 100% of their expenses, you know, 50% of their outdoor dining, 
um, and takeout. And so any additional expense um, is a challenge to them. And, and a lot of the federal money, the PPP program um, and the EIDL um, was, was to go to employees. It was to keep people on the payroll. It wasn't necessarily to offset expenses. Um, so we're, we're just trying to fill the need as we can. Um, we're still uh, working closely with Norfolk Works um, and, and really trying to help businesses um, that have impact, been, been impacted. Um, you know, the, the unemployment rate, um, as you know, has, has gone up considerably. And so we're, we're continuing to um, try to roll out uh, programs and additional services for residents um, to tie them into Norfolk jobs. And then, um, and Megan, Megan will talk about this more in a second, um, but we're working to secure an additional $3 million in, in grants and loans through various sources um, that hopefully we'll be able to roll out in the coming weeks um, to provide additional um, assistance to businesses. I want to talk a little bit just about in our business intelligence, so sort of what's going on on the ground. Um, 40 per 46% of businesses that we've engaged um, have been moderately or severely impacted by COVID. Um, so almost half of the businesses in Norfolk um, have been impacted. 34% of those businesses would say that they are at moderate or significant risk of permanently closing. Um, I, this is not anything that is you know, just in Norfolk. This is a national trend, um, but it's concerning. And so we, we've identified those businesses. We're gonna have continued discussions with them, um, and, but they've been flagged for, for more follow-up and assistance. Um, just talking about hotel data, wanted to again talk about some, some of the uh, business intelligence on the ground. Um, you see the hotel, hotel um, occupancy rate has dropped considerably in Norfolk. Um, it's beginning to pick back up. Um, but we've got a long ways to go before, before we're back to fully recovered. Um, a lot of the, the bookings for businesses, as, as Kurt Krauss would tell you, have moved to the fall. Um, and so we're hopeful that in the fall, some of that will pick back up. Um, but there's still a risk that you know, COVID comes back and things get, get pushed out uh, to, the, to the following year. Um, airline travel, um, again, no, no surprise here. Uh, travel, travel is down 93% at Norfolk International Airport. Um, this is following the trends nationally. Um, and so this is actually TSA checkpoint data. Um, this is not broken out by Norfolk, but Norfolk's uh, chart looks very similar to that. But you can see what it was a year ago as uh, compared to what it is today. Um, one one uh, great thing is cargo traffic is up 6%. So we are seeing more product, more, more stuff coming through um, inter Norfolk International. And then this is, I uh, just want to show you Google mobility data. So we're able to um, look at some Google data that um, takes anonym, just anonymized traffic data based on your cell phone usage. And um, they, they take a baseline and then they take a length of stay for how much you've actually stayed at a, say, a restaurant, a shopping center, a museum, or a theater. And they track this by locality. So you can see Norfolk, we're somewhat in the middle there. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this data. Um, during the phase one and phase two of the reopening to see if business is actually coming back, um, what areas it's coming back to, what sectors it's coming back to, and what areas of Norfolk um, people are actually going back um, and visiting. So uh, I would just say going forward, um, you know, we're, we're supporting the needs of, of businesses as the business climate um, evolves, right? It's, it's a, um, you know, phase, we, we now know phase two is going to be Friday, um, so we're going to continue to work with our partners to try to pivot there. Um, we're gonna continue to try to push out grant uh, programs as they become available um, and continue with uh, strategic uh, development to help us through this pandemic. Um, I would say if you have um, you know, anybody that needs um, a, a service um, as it relates to um, you know, anything in Norfolk, you know, refer them to norfolkdevelopment.com, you know, give them our cell phones, proactively push them to us where we want to help, we're here to help, um, and, and we um, will hopefully get through this together. So with that, I'll take any questions or... Um, Great. Right. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chuck. Uh, questions or comments? Ms. McClellan? Uh, Jared, uh, one of the... And I apologize if you mentioned this. I uh, was dealing with a kid issue in the background. Uh, so... Um, are we going to be working with our small businesses to help them get online? Because I think that's one of the concerns I have um, is to ensure that they, one, have connectivity and two, have an online presence. 
How, how can we help folks in that? Yeah, sir, they, I, they, yeah, this pandemic has just accelerated the trends that were occurring before, right? So businesses had to have an online presence. That's even more important today. So I, I, would, I would definitely agree, you know, having access to broadband, I mean, that's going to be truly important as we continue to market the city. Um, but yeah, we, we, are, we are working with them, working with Retail Alliance and other partners to ensure that we help small businesses pivot to an online presence. So that's a great point. Along those lines, I mean, it's not only having connectivity, but are we providing them sort of resources, uh, marketing, uh, website development, that sort of thing? No, we don't. We we don't get into the technical, right? Um, um, we do provide them, you know, again that business to business connection list. We've got businesses by category. We will connect them to Norfolk businesses that provide those services, um, but we don't, you know, we don't have website um, design services or that that sort of thing. So, will any of that grant money possibly be utilized? Could a business utilize that in that regard? Yeah, I think so. I think as so as we were able to identify how much money we can get, the parameters of that grant program and, and how we define what businesses get it, what it's for, that can certainly be um, that's certainly a council decision and something we can we can talk through. Okay, thanks. May I? Yes, Ms. Grace. Um, so uh, to Andrea's point, I think what we should really do is make sure that um, we are able to provide businesses with resources to get up and running and online. There are lots of people, pros, um, even young people who may be looking for an opportunity to start a business in helping other small businesses get uh, on internet savvy, if you will, and, and, and marketing savvy. I don't necessarily think we should be the trainer of all of that. I think that is a duplication of resources or a duplication of efforts for things that are already going on. But I do think that we should be somewhat of a melting pot, if that's the right term, for utilizing uh, those services and making sure that people know where they can go to get access to that information and, and use it to the best of their ability. The um, one thing that I would ask, Jared, is, um, is our economic development department engaged with uh, black brands and, and Blair Durham? Yes, yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. Okay, Mr. Riddick. Yeah, uh, question is, with the first um, series of money you were talking about, I think it was $2,000 here and there, how many black businesses uh, have enjoyed these funds? And secondly, um, uh, how many, how do we make sure that a business is not double dipping? Uh, coming to us getting money when they're also eligible for federal funds and they're getting money on on that side too you know how, I mean how is the money really reaching the people who need it versus people who might be well connected um, so if you go back to the slide um, to answer your question um, and I'll get you the exact number of, of uh, what businesses um, that we granted money to are minority businesses. I think one of the, the first things that we did was try to ensure that we are being um, inclusive across the city. And if you look at this map here, you can see um, the targeted businesses that we've engaged are primarily on the east side of Norfolk, um, through the industrial park and, and into downtown. Uh, but we have been making a very uh, strong effort to ensure that we're, we're being inclusive. Um, as it relates to money that they receive from the federal government, as part of the application for the small business assistance that we're providing, they have to certify um, whether they've received uh, federal government uh, money or not. We are trying to, uh, exactly what you said, augment other dollars and ensure that people are not double dipping and taking federal money when they don't necessarily need it. This money is for people that need it, um, and it's, it's um, to serve small businesses and small retailers. All right, Ms. Graves. Um, the other thing that I thought of when Mr. Riddick asked his question was uh, one of the things that happened with PPE was that you saw a lot of the large businesses because they had the lawyer, the accountant, the this, the that, the, the other already on file. They were easily able to 
put all their documents together and get them um, submitted so that they were appear to be eligible for PPE funds, even if they really, you know, were not and in, in, in outed in the end. Are we doing anything with regard to coaching and or mentoring for individuals who might a lot of small businesses they're a one man or one woman show and you know they're really good at what they do but they may not be great at filling out paperwork or keeping you know the best records are uh, what are we doing to help those businesses that would be eligible but maybe will have some trouble proving their eligibility so that, that's exactly what we are doing. So as part of the, the thousand or so business that we contact, the 354 that have received direct services, that's what we're doing. We are engaged with them. We're working through the issues that they have, any technical issues. Um, our small business uh, programs remain in place. We've still got our small business team and our, our small business outreach team is, is working to proactively call businesses, develop meaningful relationships with those businesses. Um, and not just, you know, blasting emails to the same group of people that, that reads the emails, right? We want to be sure that we're actually going into these communities and, and proactively pushing the information to them. Because like you said, not everybody knows, you know, there's been you know, hundreds of people that we've engaged and called, and they didn't even know they could apply for a PPP loan. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't have the banking capacity. They don't have a banker, right? So mm -hmm. getting them in touch mm -hmm. with a banker, getting them in touch mm -hmm. with a uh, small business lender is exactly what we've been doing. And it, it's really hand-to-hand -hand sort of helping people through these programs. So, you know, it, you may say, you know, you, you contacted one business, you know, one person contacted a business in a given day. They work with them all day, you know, trying to connect them to a resource. Um, so it, 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 some of this, it takes a lot of time. Um, but it's, you know, we're here to support them, and that's, that's what we're doing. So the last question I have then is, do you have enough people to do what you're doing? Because it sounds like you need a customer service call center. And so I'm just kind of wondering if maybe some of the individuals that were part-time and furloughed may be able to, if they have the skill set to do some of those calls and make some of those connections and then maybe hand them off to you know, senior staff or whatever, maybe doing like that initial evaluation of that business. Is that something that perhaps we can look at maybe bringing back one or two or three part-time people who, if you're taking all day with one person, it's going to take you a whole long mm -hmm. time to get through all of the small businesses that might need help. Yeah, and we've had that discussion with the budget office, um, especially as it relates to this new money that's coming down. If there is additional dollars coming to the federal government that we've got to deploy quickly into, into neighborhoods and small businesses, we, we may just do that exact same, the exact thing to help, um, you know, just streamline what we're doing and, and really get the money out quickly. So, Jared, yeah. Uh, Ms. Doyle? Jared, a few months ago, you hired a gentleman that was going to help with uh, businesses ease their access to the city of Norfolk and um, allow, in essence, be a business navigator. And I know that's not the title. So you've talked a lot about how we are helping businesses and connect them to external resources. How are we doing with helping businesses with their ease of transactions within the city so that they, just like we are doing with Open Norfolk, we kind of relax some uh, permitting issues. We made it easier for businesses to do things that they typically wouldn't have been permitted to do. How are we doing that on the inside of, some, of uh, the city? So in that, that person, George Hadenot, we, we've hired to help um, work with planning and work with developers through a um, streamlined process. And I'll say that the, you know, the first week, right, we were all trying to, to migrate online. Um, since then, um, we have really gotten a lot better at it. I'll, I'll say planning has been a great partner of working uh, through this, relaxing things, or if not relaxing things, just facilitating, um, you know, WebEx meetings and, and, and being able to engage quickly with businesses as, as they go through this. So um, I think um, we're in a good position, you know, and I, we, we recognize that we do not want to be as a city an impediment to a business that's opening or trying to get through a city process. We know that, you know, we, we, we have a revenue shortfall, so we want to ensure that development continues to occur. Um, so I think you know, we're in a good position and, and we've been able to streamline that and, and move 
you know, a lot of things that I think have moved online in the planning department will probably stay online, you know, for a while. So um, I think we're in a good position. Yeah, I encourage you to take advantage of all opportunities right now so that we can make it easier for people to do business with Norfolk as much as you're doing to work with businesses outside of Norfolk, meeting, facilitating connections. And Jared, your team is doing yeoman's work. So thank you very much. I know you've been working tirelessly just, you know, along with the open Norfolk crowd. So thank you. All right, Mr. Smeagol. Uh, Jared, I just wanted to know what we're doing for Hispanic uh, outreach, uh, particularly when it comes to any language barrier with understanding what uh, Norfolk has available. I, I know the city of Norfolk's getting there with our website, but it's not as friendly when it comes to uh, being translated to Spanish as I, I, I've heard from the community. So, and I don't know if you have anybody on your staff that um, is specifically working uh, with our Hispanic Latino uh, population? So we don't have anybody working um, just with that population. We, we did hire um, last year uh, a young man, Emmanuel Manicalakis. Um, he sp actually speaks five languages fluently um, out of Old Dominion University. Um, he's, real, he's helping to put all of our stuff into various languages online. Um, but we are, you know, as we see a need in, in a certain community, for example, um, as we were doing our outreach calls, um, you know, there was a business in Chesapeake, a, a Chinese restaurant that was targeted. Um, and, and so we, we had our staff meeting and we decided that day we were going to call every Chinese restaurant in Norfolk to make sure that they know that we're, you know, we're here to help them. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say that we have somebody specifically with the Hispanic community, but we are, we are trying to engage ourselves into to all of the various neighborhoods of Norfolk. Okay, and I just encourage you to reach out to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that um, has a lot of connections to our Hispanic businesses in Norfolk. Okay, okay. thank you, Mr. Smeagol. Uh, Mr. Jared Chalk, you may continue. That's it, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Riddick? Yes. Right, Mr. 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 Riddick? Yes, Mr. Riddick, go right on. Yeah. Uh, Jared was talking about calling every Chinese restaurant in Norfolk. Chinese don't need any money. They're making money hand over fist, and they always have been. They don't hire blacks, and they don't give anything back to the community. So, I mean, you're just, I guess you'd say, feathering their nest. Chinese restaurants will need a dime. And I know because I pass them every day. I see them selling crabs. I see them selling yachts. You know, so instead of calling every Chinese restaurant in Norfolk, beat the bushes and find every small black. And you say, when I say you're speaking generally or collectively, should I say, uh, minority, minority has so many different facets to it now. And you wonder why uh, black burn down these cities is because we're in a position to help, but we don't do anything. And this is what's happening, you know, in Norfolk. We don't do anything to help the small black business, you know, and uh, and and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just mystified that every time I turn around, you just said that you and Lenny, you and uh, George Holmes would hire somebody recently. I thought we had a hiring freeze, you know. The words, Mr. Mr. Mayor, that you had that little proclamation you read earlier about, um, you know, inclusiveness and all of that stuff, they are just simply idle words when it comes to blacks in the city of Norfolk. Systemically and institutional racism uh, is why you see what we've seen in these different communities. It's ridiculous that we're doing all this talking, and yet we don't have money to put these youngsters to work. And these youngsters are affected. And so you, you, when I say you have to come up to the administration, you need to find some money and some jobs, talk to Dr. Lindsay, find out what's acceptable, and put these young black kids to work. If not, you're going to have... Uh, you're lucky in North, North is never even busting a break when it comes to this stuff. We kill Raymond Chandler, you know, and nobody, you know, says anything. So, but uh, we need to do a better job, you know. Uh, so, like I say, your uh, words were 
very good and for their items. We'll go back and get the same old recycled people in Norfolk uh, and, and, and end up with the same product. And the nail program, by the time we make we meet next Tuesday, I don't care where, you can get it from a lamp post. But we need to have money for the summer program and talk to Dr. Lindsay and find out uh, what she can do to show us what's available or not. I live in a black neighborhood. I see it every day walking past my house. And uh, we just cannot not fund these youngsters in the nail program. If we do anything, we need to put that back on the board. And thank you. Mr. Smigel? I, I just wanted to say I, I, I feel really obligated to to kind of, um, Mr. Rick, I'm really upset with your comments that you made about Chinese families. And I, I don't know if that was your intentions, but I have two students at my school in which their parents own Chinese restaurants in Norfolk that had to shut down their business because of comments that our president made um, and the racial threats that they received at their restaurants. And I, I feel like we're we're really on eggshells as council people if we're putting down any cultures in the city um, right now, particularly in the state that we're in, and that those people are almost losing their jobs just as much as any other people who own small businesses here. Many of them are struggling because they had to shut down. Some could not reopen because they couldn't get supply of food. So I, I'm I, I'm sorry, Mr. Riddick. I understand what you're saying about our black community, but I, I don't believe that that was fair for your judgment on our Chinese um, community in Norfolk. And I'd be very careful with putting down any cultures in our city of Norfolk at this time. Yeah. I, I, I understand what and, uh, and I apologize, but the Chinese restaurant. I tell you what, go down. Uh, Ingles, go down, um, go to Cape Henry Avenue and, and see people trying to get in to get crabs. Go to Princess Anne Road and, uh, and, and uh, Maltby Avenue. Chinese restaurant are making money. It's not against the culture. I have nothing against the culture because before any of you guys came along, I had a, a, a Chinese festival down at, the, uh, at uh, Nautica. To, uh, to celebrate the Chinese community. So if I said that, uh, I did not mean it to sound racist, and if I look back at it, it, didn't sound, it does sound racist. But Chinese restaurants don't need any money. I'm not doing anything I'm doing about the culture. You, you, you go ride by there and look and see. You know, because the black community, that's where they make their money. They make their money off the black community, you know. But I'm not going. I'm and I apologize if it sounds like it, it. It sounded racist, and I think about it. It probably did sound racist. But I guess what I'm saying, in addition to calling all the Chinese restaurants, beat the bushes and find out how many little black restaurants you can help. So maybe I should have phrased it that way. In addition to. You know, and Tommy, I appreciate your remarks, and uh, and I, I hold them wholeheartedly. Right. Mr. Chalk, you... Jerry, does that is that does that conclude your presentation, Mr. Chalk? All right, Mr. Bender. Uh, yes, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. That concludes uh, Mr. Chalk's presentation. I asked earlier, and it maybe got lost in in um, how quickly I was talking. But I think uh, it might be beneficial. I, I think the question that's come up throughout the presentations, obviously, if it's Mel's the first phase and a transition from it, and then Jared's kind of the second phase, so there's this uh, conversation of, but for COVID, the, these monies that have come through the CARES Act, how can they be spent and on what? And so the good news is that we've had Megan Irwin, who you know through our uh, budget office, she's bird dogged this question with our federal lobbyists and many of our departments, and she's going to step forward here and engage you about uh, the COVID-19 uh, stimulus monies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of Council, uh, Chief Deputy Benda. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Megan Irwin. I'm currently the HUD Interim Compliance Manager in the Budget Office, overseeing the HUD Entitlement Grants 
And during this period, I'm also um, acting as the coronavirus stimulus coordinator. Tonight, I'll be providing an overview of the CARES Act funding that has been directed to the city of Norfolk and some of our guiding principles for these funds. Uh, now, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions about how the city is planning to spend uh, this funding, and at the end of the presentation, I'll be providing a draft spend plan. Next. The CARES Act was signed into law on March 27th and included over $1.9 trillion of economic stimulus. Uh, this has been the main stimulus package that's received a lot of news attention. It included the economic impact payments from the IRS, the Paycheck Protection Program for businesses, and the extra $600 per week in unemployment benefits. It also carved out funding specifically for state and local governments, uh, which has trickled down to Norfolk. Next. Now before I uh, jump into the amounts, I want to share a little bit about how we've responded from an administrative perspective. So shortly after the passage of the CARES Act, the city manager assigned me as the, cor the coronavirus stimulus coordinator, and I've been leading a task force dedicated to identifying, tracking, and applying for these funds. The task force has been successful so far. Um, as you can imagine, there's just been a huge amount of information uh, to digest and process over the past two months, and it's been helpful to have one central point of contact and coordination. I also want to take the opportunity to recognize the 12 task force members for their work. Um, it's just another example of how Team Norfolk goes above and beyond uh, their job duties to make sure our residents are receiving the highest quality services. Next. In total, the city of Norfolk has just under $27 million in stimulus funding so far, uh, with a couple uh, other rounds of funding um, potentially expected. Uh, the vast majority of the funding, $21.2 million, is from the Coronavirus Relief Fund that was provided to us, um, passed down from the federal government to the state and to us. Um, the remaining funds are formula-driven and were awarded directly from federal agencies. I'm going to run through each of these quickly uh, and review the Coronavirus Relief Fund last as it's the largest pot of funding. Next. Next. So far, the city has received two additional HUD entitlement, two additional allocations of HUD entitlement grants, including $2.6 million in CDBG and $1.3 million in ESG. The CDBG money is being allocated on a competitive basis, and awards are expected to be decided this month. The priority for that funding is household stability, including food, rent, and utility subsidies. The Emergency Solutions Grant funding was, directed, was directly allocated to our existing partners to provide emergency shelter and supportive services to our homeless community. Next. Norfolk Police also had the opportunity to apply for coronavirus emergency supplemental funding uh, through the Department of Justice. They worked in concert with the Sheriff's Office to identify their needs and develop a budget which will cover PPE, overtime, training, and other expenses related to the emergency. Our Economic Development Department was also recently notified of an additional $500,000 available from the federal EDA for their revolving loan funds. And they're still working through the details, but I would encourage anyone interested in applying for those loans uh, to visit development's website periodically for updates. Next. An additional 272000 was provided through CARES for the Ryan White grant. Uh, these funds will serve the Greater Hampton Roads area and are administered by the HIV Health Services Planning Council. Finally, Norfolk Fire Rescue will be using just under 200000 through the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund to cover medical supplies and personal protective equipment. Next. So we'll shift to the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, the CARES Act allocated $150 billion for states and localities through the Coronavirus Relief Fund to prepare, prevent, and respond to coronavirus. The Commonwealth of Virginia received $3.1 billion, and Fairfax County, because their population exceeds 500000 received a direct award of $200 million. The Commonwealth has allocated out of their award a total of $650 million for localities 
And on May 12th, the city of Norfolk was informed that our allocation is just under 21.2 million. So the use of this funding is restricted by US Treasury guidelines. So I'm gonna go over the restrictions as well as our internal guiding principles. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there are four primary eligibility criteria. Uh, expenses must be necessary due to the public health emergency. Any costs can't have been accounted for in the budget as of March 27th, which for us is the fiscal year 2020 budget. The expenses must be incurred, uh, by which they mean actually paid out um, between March 1st and December 30th. And in order to be reimbursed by these funds, they also can't be uh, reimbursed through any other source. Uh, so we can't double dip. And of course, the biggest caveat is that these expenses absolutely cannot be used for revenue replacement. Next. Uh, we have established some guiding principles around the use of this funding. Uh, so first, uh, these funds are one time, so they should not be used to support ongoing expenses, uh, lest we risk creating a structural imbalance in our budget going forward. Um, so what that means is uh, we can't use the funds to restore services, unfortunately, that were reduced in the 2021 budget. Uh, and they can only be used for personnel expenses on a short-term limited basis, which I'll get into uh, a little bit further on the next slide. Second, our goal is to be creative with these funds in a way that lower future costs or enhance service delivery. So while these are one-time purchases, we're making them with an eye to the future, uh, especially in regard to telework opportunities and the way that our offices are designed. Um, third, we're working with our partners to ensure that we can expend the entire award by December 30th. Um, all funds must be expended by that date. Next. So the Treasury's issued guidance that includes some explicitly eligible and explicitly ineligible activities. Um, some of these are shown here, but the list is non-exclusive. Uh, the Treasury has been periodically updating their guidance, and we've been diligently working through to determine eligible um, expenses. Now, some of the eligible expenses are basically what you'd expect, PPE, medical services, um, but they've also indicated that financial assistance to businesses and individuals are eligible activities. In terms of uh, payroll, the only eligible cost um, for, for payroll reimbursement are for staff who are substantially dedicated to mitigating or responding to COVID-19. So that largely includes our public safety, public health, and social service employees. There are also a handful of explicitly ineligible expenses, as you can see. Um, bonuses, for example, are explicitly ineligible, though hazard pay and overtime are eligible. Next. So we are actively working through a, a detailed spend plan with input from departments and uh, city agencies, but we wanted to pro provide you with a draft tonight. Uh, there are basically two goals with this funding. First, uh, we want to make sure that we're able to reimburse all of the expenses that the city is incurring due to the public health emergency. And then second, we want to be able to provide assistance to our residents and employees who are being impacted by the event. And on the city side on the left, um, if you remember, we made an assumption in the FY 2021 budget that approximately $5 million of our budgeted expenses would be able to be reimbursed with federal stimulus funds. Uh, so our plan is to accomplish that primarily through um, requesting reimbursement for our public safety workers whose work duties are substantially dedicated to mitigating and responding to COVID-19. In addition, the expenses related to reopening our public buildings and transitioning to remote work are pretty substantial, uh, not to mention the other ongoing mitigation measures like enhanced sanitization. Our tentative estimate for those costs right now is about 7.5 million. So we also recognize the importance of using the funding to directly assist our residents and employees who are impacted. Um, and those are on the right. Now keep in mind, these are still in the idea phase, uh, so these programs don't exist yet, but we are working on developing them quickly. So we've set aside $4 million for hazard duty pay to support our employees who have taken on additional risks in this environment. 
And the details are still being worked out, but the priority will be to support our frontline public-facing employees who cannot social distance due to the nature of their work. Uh, and an ordinance for the approval of a hazard duty pay plan will be forthcoming. Uh, finally, we believe it's important to set aside funding for our residents who have been uh, impacted by this, by this event. So this will take the form of financial assistance programs like rent and utility assistance, as well as grants for businesses and nonprofits whose operations have been negatively impacted and need additional support to reopen. We're working with NRHA on the financial assistance programs and economic development will be working through the program details for the grant programs. Uh, finally, we're also working with IT to identify ways that the city can improve access to Wi-Fi in the community to help reduce the digital divide. Next. So our next steps include working through the program details to move from the concept phase to deployable programs and we'll be working quickly to get these programs ready and provide assistance to those who need it. Um, but of course, good program design is essential for fair, transparent, and equitable programs. We have also promised to return to you, Council, um, with our plans uh, for your approval, so you will be seeing more details soon. Um, then, of course, we will implement the plan and spend the funding before the December 30th deadline and document our expenses appropriately so that we're prepared for any audit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or remarks or yeah, comments? Ms. Doyle? So, Megan, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very clear. Does any of this money, or, or I should say, does the school division get money separate and apart from the 21 million that we were allocated as a city? Yes, the uh, Norfolk Public Schools received their own CARES Act allocation, uh, I believe is a little over 12 million. Um, that's also fairly flexible that they can use for their expenses. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Uh, Ms. McClellan, go right on. Um, again, I, great presentation, and um, I'm going to continue to harp on this, but I think that um, that Wi-Fi um, and into the community is just so critical. Uh, it, it, that digital divide is just keeping everybody um, from work, from health care, from uh, school. So to whatever extent we can do that and, and think of it in innovative ways, that would be great. So thank you for prioritizing that. Mr. Mayor, can I just add to that? I was actually going to comment on that in the next presentation, but Andrea, to, to that point. Yes, Ms. Doyle, go right on. For those libraries and rec centers that may not open right off the bat, is there a way that we can put Wi-Fi in those areas that extend beyond the four walls of those buildings so that the neighbors can come to those facilities and sit outside and use them wisely and have access to public Wi-Fi? So while they may not be open, they're still useful for the members of the community. So thank you, Andrea, for bringing that up. Okay, Mr. Riddick. Sure. I guess my question is, I have been asking for hazardous duty pay for our sanitation workers since this has begun. And uh, I guess my question to Megan is, are our sanitation workers included in this hazardous duty pay? Uh, so what I can tell you is um, that's been in the conversation, um, but I can't tell you what's in the plan yet because it hasn't been written. Um, but but there is a, some intention uh, to consider them for that for that funding. The money cannot be used for bonuses. Correct. Yes. Um, so the Treasury has released an explanation of what they consider uh, hazard duty pay. So we're following those guidelines. So, Mr. Mr. Mayor, yes, Ms. Johnson, go right up. These workers, so, well, Mr. they Mayor, have masks on, but they, have, they don't know what's in those cans, and that is hazardous duty. And, you know, and that's just, you know, me thinking about what I see when they come down the street, you know, picking things up. They don't know what's in there. All right. All right, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Megan. Um, my question would be, Megan, uh, since there needs to be more clarity about the hazardous duty pay, um, will you please provide an update to, to council 
Um, I know you said you're going to come back as soon as you can find out um, who qualifies, uh, what department and people qualifies for the hazardous duty pay. Um, that would be great. Um, and also going back to, to Wi-Fi and technology. In some communities, there is already a plan um, that was um, put into place that many citizens came up with um, ideas for um, broadband, Wi-Fi, and technology for um, their community. So, um, Megan, if you, you could go back, um, planning as well as the city, various departments, should have a list of, of those communities. One of the communities was um, Broad Creek. Um, the vision for the technology, the Wi-Fi, and the broadband that is needed um, in the, the, the community to, to serve um, the citizens of Norfolk. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Any other questions, remarks, concerns for Megan? Yes, I have a comment. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I got a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, I would like to reiterate and 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 agree and support in as strongest terms possible um, with Mr. Riddick. I don't think I've ever agreed with anything that he said more than this um, than figuring out how we can, if it means that, I mean, figure out what we have to do in order to make sure that our sanitation workers are getting are eligible for hazard pay because you know I, I agree with mr riddick they don't know what they're picking up they don't know what they're inhaling we have done a great and they they're responsible for keeping our city beautiful and so i just want to make sure that we do whatever it is figure figure it out creatively however way you have to do it whatever language you have to use in order to um, include our sanitation workers in that hazard pay category. I definitely, I know we can't do bonuses, I get all that, but I wanna make sure that we include our sanitation workers um, in our hazardous duty pay. And as it relates to technology, I want to also ensure that we cover not only the um, public housing in St. Paul's, but also the public housing on the south side, as well as our senior facilities, where we have a lot of internet savvy senior citizens who may not have internet access um, at their, wherever they live, if they're living in high rises and things like that. So I definitely wanna make sure that we put them on the radar as well when we start talking about hot spots and i love courtney's idea it was actually something that one of the gentlemen um lb over on the south side brought to me with regard to um allowing access to wi-fi from the buildings from the parking lot and people can still be socially distanced but they can still use the um wi-fi um, that the city will provide so figure that out and make it work so that it benefits those who really need it. And we don't end up like another PPE gone wrong program. Okay, That's all you. I got. Thank you, Ms. Grace. All right, thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have uh, Mike Goldsmith and Pete Beerick. Correct, sir. Thank you, Mr. Binda. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the uh, ability to come in and address you all on what we're doing, uh, getting towards uh, working with the persistent threat of COVID-19 in the background. Uh, really, this is a story about how we're innovating as an organization to try to uh, make sure that we can work successfully and deliver the services that our residents need and expect, and at the same time keeping them safe as well as our, our team safe, uh, understanding um, the nature of, of the virus that's in the background. Next slide, please. So what we know is that uh, COVID-19 is a persistent threat. Uh, there's no vaccine. Uh, the treatments that we have at this point are experimental. Um, and barring a vaccine or treatment, um, 
we have to take into account the ability to work with this in the background. Uh, our planning window right now is two plus years uh, based on looking at pandemics in the past and looking at what this virus is doing. Um, we, everything that we do is going to be driven uh, by what public health tells us. So we are using science to determine what our posture is and uh, we'll be relying heavily on risk mitigation strategies uh, to develop a sustainable operational tempo. And that is really what this is about. Uh, understanding that we've got this risk in the background, we have to be able uh, to develop a way to work recognizing this. And what this means is not necessarily chasing the curve, but uh, making sure that we reach a tempo that will sustain us through multiple waves of illness. Next slide, please. So when we talk about mitigating risk, you re basically have four large strategies that you can rely on. Uh, one is to accept the risk, and that means you've done the calculation that any potential loss is uh, greater, uh, is less than the cost of mitigation. Um, so you're going to, to accept the risk and drive on. A transfer generally uh, involves an insurance product or a reinsurance product that makes you whole after the potential, uh, against the potential loss. Uh, think about your flood insurance in this way. So you put yourself at potential risk by living next to the water in a flood zone, and you insure yourself in order to try to make yourself whole and therefore transfer the risk to the insurance company um, with where you live. Uh, the other one is to avoid, and that means to remove the opportunity for risk, uh, for loss or, or working in the risk, and the other is to mitigate, which is basically an action plan that allows you uh, to recognize the risk and then reduce it. Next slide, please. In this, in this situation, we do not believe that accept and transfer the appropriate risk strategies uh, for obvious reasons. Nobody's insuring you against COVID, and uh, the potential loss in this is, is a lot of people getting sick and potentially dying. So we are, in our plan, leaning heavily on avoid and mitigate. And, and the idea behind this is we're going to avoid what we can and mitigate what we must in order to get people back to work and in situations uh, as safely as possible and making sure that our residents are, are safe as well. Next slide. So these were our guiding principles that we went through uh, in trying to develop this plan. Uh, one, you know, safety, health, and security is paramount to our residents and the folks that work uh, as part of our team. Um, we are going to, to continue to deliver uh, the highest level of service possible to our community, the service that they've come to expect. Uh, we are going to conduct a phased reopening process, uh, monitoring the data that's available to us uh, with contingency plans that allow us to quickly shut down again should we see an increase in infections um, and illness. Uh, we also want to make sure that we are aligning uh, city policies with, uh, with the governor's guidelines as well as federal guidance and making sure that we are looking at workplace safety and health procedures. Although I will say our plan is somewhat agnostic to phase. Uh, what we are doing is finding sustainable operational tempo that allows us to work through multiple ways of illness. If we get another wave sometime later in the summer or in the fall and winter, we want to make sure that the tempo that we've adopted doesn't have to, we don't have to change much in order to sustain our work. And that's the goal that we're going through here. Uh, with that said, I'm going to now call Pete Burek up to the mic and uh, he can talk about what we've done and the work that we've done with others. Thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council, Mr. Benda. I'm going to speak a, a little bit um, more specifically, next slide please, about uh, our Norfolk's safe and strong approach uh, and some of our, our work that's being done uh, to restore city services uh, in a safe manner. So Norfolk safe and strong is, we think of it as our collective ethos for recovery in our community. It's really bridging uh, the city services and the city side of things with the business community and our community. Um, we heard already tonight about the great work that Mel Price and the whole Over Norfolk team is doing to help businesses um, innovate and uh, open safely. Um, and um, we're really proud of that work. And we're, we're starting to think about on the city side, how can we bring cities, uh, city services back, deliver them differently, um, and in a safe way going into the future. Uh, the link we, we see is between the two right now is, is a working group that um, Vice Mayor Thomas has been chairing and each member of council has invited members of the business community to participate in called um, uh, Norfolk Safe and Strong Working Group. We've been meeting periodically to uh, have an open channel with the business community about their questions, their concerns, their needs as it relates to reopening, make sure that they know the latest and greatest as it relates to executive orders at the state level, um, opportunities for funding available to them to help with um, costs they have with, the, with COVID and the like. Uh, that's been very successful. 
um, and, and we hope that's been a, a productive way to, to dialogue between the city and the business community. Next, please. But through all, throughout all of this, I uh, want to reiterate that uh, the city of Norfolk has had a really great success in, in continuity of services throughout this pandemic. Um, uh, Mr. Goldsmith and I uh, worked through some uh, facilitated conversations week before last by the uh, deputy city manager portfolios to hear about uh, operations, what's being done remotely, what needs to be considered to be brought back, maybe in a partial or a full in-person setting, um, to get a sense of where we need to go uh, on the administration side. Uh, the operations portfolio, Mr. Bender's, por Bender's portfolio, as you all know, many of those services that, that those departments have been providing have, have continued with physical and social distancing modifications. Uh, one exception is the in-person inspections that we do for code and for construction. Uh, and, and Mr. Homewood and his team um, have started to get back in that business of in-person in inspections, but only in unoccupied structures. Uh, and they're thinking about new ways to uh, use technology to, to start doing um, inspections um, in the future. And Mr. Um, Rogers' community portfolio, right now a lot of the uh, services that those departments are providing are operating under waivers from federal and state agencies that allow them to provide services remotely, but then also get compensated and reimbursed for those services. And if and when those, um, those waivers are changed, that will drive the shift back to in-person services, for example, foster care, interviews of families, and um, on the CSB side for case manager check-ins every 90 days. Those can currently be done virtually and have been done virtually, and will continue that way until there's a, a need uh, to bring them back, uh, mostly related to the funding reimbursements. Um, and on the finance and administration side, most of those services have been accomplished remotely and will continue to do so in, indefinitely into the future. And for public safety, it has been um, complete continuity of operations with, uh, with physical and social distancing modifications. They're out there on the front lines every day. So we appreciate what our uh, first responders are doing. Next slide, please. One thing I want to highlight here is a, a real success uh, that we've had in uh, the transition to telework. Um, th this chart shows you between um, uh, the month of March and, and now in May, um, just the rapid acceleration and transition we've had to city workers every day working from home. So this is um, the number of sessions per week that folks log in on our telework systems. Right now we have over 800 city staff who are full-time, regularly five days a week or more, logging into uh, city um, systems via these ways. And there, there's others that are using um, systems out in the field and others, so this is probably an undercount, but it hopefully gives you a sense of, of how quickly we shifted to a telework environment, and, and it's, it's been very successful and it's helped keep our, our, um, our staff safe, but also um, been able to deliver services virtually. Next, please. So when we think about the services that are not currently happening, um, that we need to consider how um, and when we need to bring level, some level of service back, uh, this is the, the, the questions that, that we're asking ourselves and asking our departments. And based on our, our public health situation that Dr. Lindsay talked about and our current um, budget reality, what are we not doing that we need to consider bringing back again? What are the facilities and the staff required to support those? And, and generally speaking, what have we learned from this pandemic in terms of service delivery and how can we deliver services diff differently uh, in, the, in the future? Next, please. So our thinking about bringing services back, um, we, we think about this as um, a, co a continuum of services that, like Mel Price said, allows the city to ebb and flow with the changing conditions that we might find ourselves in. So this, this chart, reads from left to right, and, and um, you think about the health conditions, uh, uh, guidance from the state, and orders at the state, and how they affect our city services and facilities. Um, and, and, and as you move from left to right, we, we see additional access to city facilities, like libraries, and to some rec centers uh, coming back online, and additional services being provided virtually, and in the community, and, and in new ways. Next, please. Uh, just want to give you a quick update on things we're doing to um, address workforce and facility safety as we start to, to plan for bringing folks back into um, our facilities and seeing residents face to face. Um, General Services has done a fantastic job in uh, sourcing materials and being creative and, and building in-house a lot of um, systems to help um, with uh, physical distancing, like for example, with the picture you see on your left of Jordan Newby Library and the sneeze guards that have been placed at the circulation desk. You'll see those in, in all the facilities that uh, we have on the table for some sort of reopening in the future. 
Uh, in the middle there, you see some branded um, Norfolk um, safety signage and verbiage that is, that is um, already up in City Hall. I saw it walking in today. Um, and we plan to roll this out across all city facilities so we're consistent in the way we're messaging, um, social distancing, and, and the like. And our fire rescue team has been um, a great partner in developing some online training and potentially offering some in-person training for departments that are um, learning how to use and operate with personal protective equipment for sometimes the first time um, in their careers. And, and these folks do it every day. And so they've um, they developed some online training that's available. And um, as we start to reboard um, staff, as, as Lynn Clements will, will tell you in a little bit, she likes to use that term, reboard staff into their normal work environments. In some cases, they need additional training. And this is one of the things that we're working with. So um, next slide, please. So our way ahead uh, in planning for reopenings is uh, we're working at the department level um, to talk about um, ver the various scenarios that, we, that I showed um, in the con continuum of services. Um, we've had very successful meetings with Greg Bach and the zoo team and, and all the departments you're going to hear from next. Um, that team that has met with them has really been a, a collaboration between the, the health department. We appreciate Dr. Lind Lindsay and her staff's partnership at every single one of those meetings. Um, Basically, departments are bringing their thinking and their plans to that group and, um, and vetting them. And so with a, with a public health lens, first and foremost, but also we're bringing our, our risk manager to the table and Lord Crouch and her team to think about how we communicate what we're doing to our residents and, and set the expectations as to what they might see in our facilities and in our community soon. So that's been very successful and we're doing that with uh, John Ramstein and his cultural facilities group next to talk about some outdoor things that, that could happen for them and what that looks like. And as um, Mel talked about before, we'll continue to explore opportunities to activate the outdoor space and public spaces. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Mr. Crittenden is going to have more to say about that here in a moment. And like Mr. Goldsmith uh, said, none of us um, uh, want this, um, uh, this virus to come back. But um, for the potential of the rebound sometime this summer or fall, um, alongside a hurricane season that just started, um, and um, a, a, an election in November that is likely going to see high turnout. Um, that's a confluence of high-risk events that we just want to be prepared for and, and have thought through deliberately. So um, emergency operations team um, and, and others are coming together to game plan what um, a high-stress scenario like that could look like and what our responses would be um, at the city ahead of time. So we are going to be as well prepared as we can, thinking for futures that we hope we don't have to address. Uh, that concludes my presentation. We'll take any questions from myself or Mr. Goldsmith, and then we've got some departments who are going to talk about um, their services uh, next. Thank you. Thank you, you uh, Pete and, and Mike. Questions for Mr. Bierig or Mr. Goldsmith? All right, Mr. Smeagle. Yeah, I expressed my concern to the city manager before about um, permitting uh, and any position that is mainly a single person that good can go out to a site and I just would like to strongly encourage that we start reopening some of those services we we want economic development to continue happening in the city of Norfolk and we just we need to get our officials out that can grant permits we've told our businesses and other people that they have to go to a third party if they wanted to get done faster and I know some of it is also the backlog that could happen in planning but, you know, as I stated before, I've been required to go to work two days a week uh, from 10 to 2 for now weeks and my office staff. And we have been able to manage it and be safe and healthy. And I, I'm just hoping I, I'm not, I don't want anybody to get um, sick from this, but we can't sit here and, to, and continue to just maintain in a shutdown mode. Uh, and we've got to figure out ways quicker to reopen and allow people to work. And I'm going to tell you, there are, we do have um, departments that are working and coming in. And I feel really bad that they are coming to work every day, some of them, and they're getting furloughed those five days. Um, they're, they are accruing annual leave. And we have employees that haven't had to do a lot or anything. And they're still accruing um, annual leave. And I, we just got to find a way to get it open. I'll tell you, other cities, and it's not to put on Norfolk, I appreciate the fact that our manager has taken a more cautious approach to this. But other cities have made their employees come back, um, whether it's by shifts or extending the day. And, and we really got to get moving on this. I appreciate the work you guys are doing. 
but I would love to see some more of our departments get open sooner than later so that we can reopen some of our, um, you know, our economic development side and, and get that activated. And I know some members of council will disagree with me and that's fine. Uh, I, that's just my opinion and what I've heard from my constituents about getting Norfolk services back open. Okay, thank you, Ms. Smeagle. Ms. Johnson? Yes, um, thank you for, for everything, um, Team Norfolk. Um, but one of my concerns in all of the planning of this and getting the city up and running is the, the employees being furloughed for five days. So I will put the question out there um, that how could we be more creative? And I, I think that that was one of the things that uh, Councilman Smeagle was addressing, although I do not speak for him, um, is the, the five day furlough um, of our employees. Um, the, the burden on our employees and we're asking them to furlough for five days um, and how creative can we be? Although we say that uh, we've tried many different ways how we could address it. I think maybe um, because we have such smart people such as yourself, uh, Mr. Beard, that you and the, the rest of Team Norfolk could figure in the budget, the budget department and anybody else to figure out how we could help those employees being um, furloughed. Is it possible because they accumulate um, other leave, they have sick leave and, and they have vacation time. Um, can they use that or we, we, we just have to figure out a way. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing that again, if please, if you could put that on your list of of things to do um, for as a city council request. Thank yes, you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Make a comment. Yes. Yes, Ms. Ms. Grace. Okay, so um, as much as I don't like furloughing employees, I know that we have gone through these other difficult times where we've actually had to terminate employees, call it reduction in force, call it a buyout, whatever it is you want to call it, we have had to do that. And um, I think a lot of that may have occurred, you know, early in my tenure and it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant or anything like that. I like the idea of allowing someone to use a day of leave time or a couple of days of leave time or whatever. I'm not sure how that all balances out with regard to the budget um, and, 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 and the numbers, but I do like that idea. The other thing I think I'll take a step further in that is we're talking about 2% of, of an individual's pay. And that goes to their retirement, that goes to their the percentage of money that they receive when we do a 2% raise at some point in the future, if we have done a 2% reduction in their pay because they've been basically a week out of work and a week without funds, then we're only giving them back what we took from them. So what I would like to see is how can we, if not in this budget cycle, because we are asking everybody to make a sacrifice in this budget cycle, and it's a do it now, so we don't have to drag it out later. Um, it's kind of like just you know when you when you were little, and your parents put the little uh, um, string around your tooth, and they just yanked it out. You know, we're just yanking it out instead of just. Yeah, I get. I, I, I'm I'm good with that part, but I want to find out how in the future we can make sure that we make our city employees whole again with this 2% reduction in pay that they are in essence being asked to take. And so that we don't negatively impact folks' um, 
retirement and negatively impact or neutrally impact them when they're getting raises and things of that nature. And the last thing I would just like to say is kudos to everybody who has worked on this. I know that it's difficult. It's thing. It's not something that you woke up one morning and thought you would probably ever have to do. And you all have adapted. You have been flexible. You have been fluid. And kudos to you guys. And the second last thing I'm going to say is, Tommy, permitting is working. They are absolutely working. And there are a lot of city employees who are working from home. And I've spoken to some a number of them. And they're telling me that they're working more from home than they did at work, which, you know, is neither here nor there. But I've heard a lot of people say that, that they're doing more work from home than they did when they were actually physically in the building. So permitting is definitely working. And George and his staff are doing a great job. They are being safe. They're not going on to sites where there are people there. And, you know, a lot of times the builders and the construction workers, they want to do what they want to do. But we have to make sure that we are making that we're protecting our employees and that we're making them safe. So as long as the builders and, 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 employ- and, and contractors are following the rules, they really shouldn't have a problem. That's all I got. So, so Councilwoman, I would say I don't have I don't have the answers to everything that you put out, but I will say. Um, as far as the retirement payment goes, uh, the, the retirement will still be based on the base pay. The 2% will not affect uh, anything for retirement calculations. So the average uh, final compensation number should still uh, be correct. And I will say you are dead on in our facilitated discussions with the department heads, almost to a person, they felt like uh, their workforces had become very efficient at working from home and teleworking. And they were actually getting more work done uh, than by having them in the office. Mr. Mayor. Um, Colin, go right on. Okay. I, it, um, in the spirit of shared sacrifice, um, and we're talking about furloughs, uh, and I know it won't be a large amount to the budget, but as city council members and the mayor, we all receive a small salary. And I feel like we should also be taking a cut to show that we're in this all together. Um, I don't know what that looks like, uh, but I think that we need to take a look at that too. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Collin. The others? All right. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Binder? Uh, Mr. Mayor, in advance of this meeting, um, the council had asked for an update uh, from Recreation Parks and Open Space Libraries and Slover Library about a way forward. And so tonight we have um, Sonal, Lynn, and Daryl who give their presentations. First up is Sonal. Thank you. So good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Benda, Mr. Bull, Mr. Fishko. I would like to walk you through quickly here uh, with the reopening plan for Norfolk Public Library. We envision to reopen in a very strategic and thoughtful manner based on guidance from the city as well as the Department of Health. Our guiding principle is the safety and health of our citizens and staff. And as we move forward with our operations, we will continue to provide the virtual services, which is where we are basically now with offering social media programming email telephone assistance, and answering any questions that the citizens might have. We will have staff in the building wearing masks and preparing the building for reopening to the public. Then we will move into the grab and go where citizens will be coming into the building to grab and go books and materials that have been pulled by the staff. Only the information Excuse desk. Excuse me, there, are you, um, your presentation isn't advancing. I don't know if that's supposed to be the case. Oh. I'm sorry, your next slide, next slide, please. Yes, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Then we will get, move into the grab and go phase, which would be our pretty much next phase where citizens will be coming into the buildings and taking, taking books and materials that have been pulled by the staff. Only the information desk on the first floor will be activated. Previous slide, please. We will have the building space reconfigured to keep in mind the safety and physical distancing rules, obviously. 
The next phase would be where we would have more of a retail approach where patrons will be coming in the building and of course social distancing rules will be followed. In this phase though, the second floor will be activated with limited number of patrons and seating available so that we can accommodate most patrons. Finally, when we become Norfolk safe and strong, we expect that there will be access to computers, meeting rooms, study rooms, ensuring there's six feet distance between furniture and computers. And in this phase, we also anticipate in-person programming, of course, social distancing rules being followed. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the programmatic focus here with an insight of what programs and services will look like in the path moving forward beyond bricks and mortar. We have several opportunities, as we know, to address the gaps in services during the closure of neighborhood branches. As you might have seen on social media, we continue to provide extensive online access to ebooks, online video, and audiobooks through a wide variety of platforms. The library staff will continue to provide and promote these services. As Councilwoman Doyle just pointed out, branches will have wireless access points. They do have that in the branches right now to be able to activate the drive up Wi-Fi access. As you all know, programming is one of our centers of excellence with our youth, school age, STEM, adult, and multicultural programming. We plan on continuing um, a wide variety of programs through Facebook right now and hopefully in person later, such as baby garden, toddler time for our early literacy audience, science time, craft time for school age, paint night, gardening and yoga for adults, just to name a few. Next slide, please. We do plan on continuing on this journey and hope to provide in-person programming as and when we can. And I do invite you all, if you already have not seen this, to come up and check out some on Facebook Sunday Uplift program, which is really, really rejuvenating and provides some spiritual inspiration during these times. Next slide, please. We are planning on utilizing the treasure truck, which is our mobile outreach and delivery service during this period. We will be developing a schedule soon for it. Also, as and when we have the resources, we would be exploring and looking into some programs and services at additional branches, possibly. We will definitely provide during this time mailing and communication to citizens of what's on Facebook, what's in our anchor branches, and information on the treasure truck activity. Next slide, please. In terms of collaborations and key partnerships, which is key right now, I'm excited about this great partnership with recreation, parks, and open spaces to develop express free libraries for the five reopened rec centers, which will contain a shelving unit, possibly some lounge seating, books, magazines, and other in informational brochures. These would be modeled after the Life360 partnership that we developed back in MacArthur Mall in 2017. The vision for this is to be an exchange library in the way that little libraries function out there. Next slide, please. Another great project that's already in place is the Little Free Libraries. It's a great initiative of the Friends of the Library. We currently have 65 of these in the city, as you can see on the map. We will look into partnering with the Friends of the Norfolk Public Library and Department of Neighborhood Development to see where we could potentially increase and build some new little free libraries. Next slide, please. Furthermore, into collaborating and key partners, I'm really excited about this project that's underway, which is Read 1000 Books Before Kindergarten. This is a great collaboration with the North Public Schools. We have already partnered with our early literacy coordinator and will be taking this project into the pre-K pre classes in September, hopefully. Furthermore, in collaborating with the schools, there will be some special events programming throughout the year, such as Read Across America, Dr. Seuss Day, and Teen Read Week. Summer reading program is always offered to our Norfolk residents and children attending summer schools this is a sort of a joint partnership between the two agencies, Norfolk Public Schools and Norfolk Public Libraries. This has been done for years and will continue to be done. 
We are planning on and looking forward to providing virtual summer reading program this year. Thanks again to the Friends of the Norfolk Public Library each year for sponsoring and funding this great needed program for our communities. Next slide, please. This coming year is the 75th anniversary of the fire department, and we have already started to partner with them. They have done several story times for our Facebook page. And all these great men and women that you see in the photograph have or will be doing a story time for the Facebook for Libraries. We also just found out that Chief Boone's folks will be joining in the fun. Next slide, please. How would we measure success? to make sure that our residents are being provided the great quality programs and services. We would do that by, do, by tracking the number of attendees, computer usage, um, just anecdotal information, comments from patrons, and obviously social media comments as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I know there's, that's a lot to read, uh, but since March, we have already been on the path to success here in terms of providing virtual programs, and these are 100 plus popular programs that have been provided to our citizens on Facebook and social media. So we are really, really thrilled to con not only continue, but grow these as, as and when we can. Next slide, please. Talk about exponential impact. Here is a sampling of our great comments we have received from people who love Norfolk Public Library and all the great programs and services that have continued. And we really are excited to move ahead in this path and journey. This concludes my presentation. I'm open to any questions, comments you might have. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question or two? Uh, yes, uh, go right on. So, Sonal, thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you. I just, I've received anywhere from 20 to 30 emails in the last 24 hours regarding the opening of libraries. The community is very interested, and I've been communicating back that the three anchor branch libraries, yes. Jordan, Newby, Fretlow, and Slover, will open basically starting July 1st. And I think it's important that we name the three so people are aware. Sure. Um, but let me ask you, how quickly do you think you'll... Um, migrate from virtual services to the grab and go express where people can actually come in and take a peek on the first or second floor. So we'll of course wait on the guidance from the Department of Health. We will prepare the buildings very thoughtfully to make sure that we have the physical distancing, markings, regulations, and all of those followed. But most of the libraries in Virginia have already moved into this phase and we, we are just waiting for the green signal. Okay, so if I could with the city communications, let's be very um, transparent and clear on what libraries are opening, when they're opening, and what's available, because I really do think the community is really craving for these to be open, as they are the rec centers. Yes, ma'am. I don't know why you're here. I think it's just important to name that it's the three anchor branches. That's correct. So on. now the other question I've gotten is, let's say I want a book that's not at one of the three anchors. Can I still get it because it'll be transported from a smaller library to, let's just say, Pretlow for me to go pick up. And I've been answering yes, is that correct? That is correct, because we plan on having a process here developed very, very soon. In fact, we are working through that right now to make sure that all the books get back to the Pine Ridge Center, which is our storage, basically, and then get dispersed out. So yes. OK. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Mayor. Let's go right on, Ms. McClellan. Uh, following on Courtney's comments, um, well, first of all, um, to hear that other libraries around the state are already opening and we're not concerning. So I hope that, um, I'm not sure why, what the July 1st deadline is um, for us or when that start date is. Um, and I've heard a lot of concern about the branches not opening and questions about whether or not there could be some sort of, uh, as they do in other local library systems, I think Chesapeake and others, where there's a uh, drop off and pick up, you literally are, you're not going in a library, there's just a staff member there. I don't know if you make an appointment, uh, there are best practices elsewhere. So sure. um, are we looking into that and how quickly could we get some of those branches open in that regard? So the curbside service, which was at one point very popular, I think soon dissipated because of some of the 
um, regulations in terms of the health regulations based on you know the touching of the books and how long the books need to be in quarantine and that kind of thing. So actually, Ches Chesapeake activated that about a few weeks ago, and I just heard they actually have um, uh, drawn back from that uh, concept. So some are doing it where it's manageable and they don't see the influx of the books and materials in the way our branches do. So I'm just I'm yes. having a hard time understanding the difference between somebody going into a retail environment or go going into the grocery store and picking up items and the cashier handling them and a, a library system and how how that would how does that differ and why can't if we can open up retail and restaurants why can't we open up libraries so as and when again Ms. McLennan that we get the go in terms of actually public being able to come in. We are prepared to go uh, go and move ahead with our literally grab and go as well as retail phase. So um, that's what we have envisioned during that time period that we will make sure all the regulations are followed. However, as soon as we reopen and we are in that particular phase, we will make sure that that's happening with both the first and second floor activations. So at this what I'm hearing you say is at this time there is no, um, I know we're, we're, it's a financial issue, uh, why the branches aren't being open. Are there, is there any sort of limited, you know, one, one day a week, uh, one day every two weeks where we could open some of the branches up? I just, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm hoping we can get something out there. I totally appreciate what we're doing with the grab and go and the three anchors, but I, I'm just, I'm getting an overwhelming um, sense, you know, we've got one, uh, one branch library in my ward, it's got the third highest circulation of anything in the city and it's being closed. And, and also, this is really important. There's this idea that these branches are going to be closed indefinitely. Could you please speak to that? Because that I don't believe that is the intention whatsoever. Um, Ms. McLennan, I would um, defer that to Mr. Goldsmith, if you don't mind. So I hear the concern. Um, that perhaps we're not opening up and, and some about the posture that we've taken. But let me be clear here. Um, yes, while real estate stores are open and people can go in and do grocery shopping and the folks that are doing the grocery shopping are probably at lower risk because they're not in there very long, uh, the folks that are working in those stores are at risk. And that's why they're considered frontline essential personnel and there have been illnesses and there have been deaths as far as grocery clerks are concerned because they're in that environment all day long breathing that air. So we are taking a very slow and deliberate approach to make sure our folks are safe because they have to be in there all day. It isn't just about uh, you know, rushing this thing in, in because retail's open that we're gonna, that we're gonna take a posture that, that risks our folks unnecessarily. Understanding that there's always going to be some risk. Uh, that said, I would also argue that due to the nature of critical um, services that cities deliver, that makes us just a little bit different. It, it, while we want our retail stores to be open and to flourish and our restaurants to be open and to flourish and to make sure that they're returning taxes to the, to the city and our residents can enjoy that, the fact of the matter is that if a restaurant closes, that isn't a critical service. If I lose a fire station or if I lose a bunch of police officers or if I lose a bunch of librarians to sickness, then I've got to close something down and that critical service doesn't get delivered. That's why we're taking the slow and deliberate approach to make sure that our folks are safe and can, can deliver and sustainably deliver services throughout this environment. Could you address the issue of uh, the concern that the branch libraries will be indefinitely closed? They will not be, Councilwoman. They will not be indefinitely closed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. M Mr. Mayor, just I just want to add on to what Councilwoman McClellan was saying, and I just want to go back to what I said earlier. The governor just announced phase two that almost everything can reopen, but with limited uh, amounts. And I, and I think that's where, Andrew, you're probably hearing the same concerns, that Norfolk is choosing to not open up the libraries, not the governor. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I want to make that clear. The, the, the governor never closed the libraries. <laughs> they, it, it was, we, we made the decision as a city to close the libraries. And so with phase two, 
technically libraries could be reopening and I, I but I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that it's a Norfolk choice not to do that to protect the employees. If that's the answer <laughs> that we need to give, then we need to say that because, you know, going back to what uh, Chief Goldsmith said, people are paying taxes, so they want their services back open. And, and that's where some of this is coming from. So there is a way to open up libraries and limit the amount of people who come into them. You have to put somebody at the door and you say you get one hour in the library to go check out a book and come back out. You don't keep people around just or it's by appointments or something. There is a way to do this. Uh, and I, I just don't want us to keep on passing an excuse on that we can't reopen. We can. It's just our choice to do it to protect citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smigel. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Um, so in looking at the three anchor branch libraries that are going to be open and um, I guess recreation centers are coming next, I suppose it, we're going to talk about that. I am on my technology right now is just really jacked up. So I don't know where we are, but um, I, I am very concerned that I'm not hearing anything about what is going to be open on the south side. We have a library, we have a rec center, we have an aquatic center over there. And while we may not be able to open every single thing over there that is of recreational use, um, we, I, I want to hear what we are specifically going to do to address the needs of the south side with regard to a library or the rec center or the aquatic center or taking some space and maybe making it a a a, a three uh try uh used uh facility for all three services or whatever but i'm not hearing that and so i i, I think it's a little ridiculous to require people to go all the way from Berkeley and Campostella to downtown. Um, I think, and I get trying to get to, you know, all the people, but we're not hitting the four corners of the city and maybe somebody's going to get to it, but I haven't heard it yet. So I want to make sure that we hit the four corners of the city with this reopening of services for that includes the South side. All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Graves. Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Johnson. If I, if I may say something, um, when we talk about the quadrants with, within the city, um, and I'm fully aware of um, how the city can be divided um, by quadrants, as well as Ward 3 being divided, we chose the three anchor branch libraries Clover, um, Tommy, the one that's in your war, Pretlow, and um, Jordan Newby. Again, we have major intersections throughout our city. And last year, saddened that I lost two children to those major intersections in Ward 3. Um, and so when we look at the quadrants, and I know that Team Norfolk is, is planning and everything. The, the south side, the south side has, I'm interested in what the plan is for the south side because they don't have anything at this point. The other area, uh, south side is Horace Downey, I think. Then you have Park Place which is on the other side of town, um, they don't have any access. Um, and then Baron Black, which uh, is uh, near Tanner's Creek Elementary, major highway, um, military highway. So I'm very interested in listening to what the plans are. How do we address those three areas um, we, we, you discussed the little libraries, which is a fantastic 
idea. It's great. It does work. Um, but will that be the only way um, that those areas of the city will be able to have any library um, accessibility? So thank you very much, Team Norfolk, for all that you do. But I was just thinking about the quadrants within the city and we have the three major anchor branch libraries, but people have to travel miles to get to those library. And I heard you say, you're gonna do the outreach. So um, I'm excited about that, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to hear what the plans are for those three areas I just mentioned. Thank you so very much, Team Norfolk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Binder. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I want, uh, this is great feedback. Um, what we've proposed here tonight is, is, a, is a path forward, and that, that's what you it, uh, asked from us as far as it relates to recreation parks, open space libraries, and, and Slover. Um, what we've shown or, or exhibited today, uh, again, we chose the three branches, and, and uh, what I'll remind you is um, that we've uh, furloughed the better part of 500 plus employees, most of whom were our rec center specialists and also our librarians. And so some of this is also resources, the uh, availability of people to kind of address and perform the services that we're talking about. And so what we can do um, in hearing the um, feedback from you and your peers about expectations in certain areas of our city, we can reconfigure what we've drafted as an example of, of how we in, intend to deliver these services and also measure them against what you've said and, and come back with, uh, with more input or feedback. Winter, I'm gonna say to you that that's a great politically correct answer and it would be great if this was the first time I had asked y'all about the south side this is actually the third time that I can recall that I've asked about the south side so for y'all to put a plan together and not include it doesn't say to me that you're hearing what I'm saying to you and now you say well we'll go back and we'll look at it well what have y'all been looking at because I know that this is at least the third time I've asked that question about how we provide services to that particular section of town that has the facilities and to figure out how we can make those facilities work best. Actually, they have four facilities because they've got the Resource Center in Campostella. How can we make those facilities work best for our residents? So when y'all come back again, if it's not there, I'm going to ask for it again, and we'll have this conversation for the fourth time. And I, I really hope we don't have to have it for the fourth time, because I hope that you guys get it together and bring it back when you come back to us again. But to have a plan for reopening and not include the South Side after having me ask for it for three different times doesn't speak volumes to me about you all listening and paying attention to what I'm asking for for my constituents. That's all. Understood. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Uh, Bindu, let me just uh, weigh in. At our last council meeting, when we were uh, shoring up the budget, uh, we, we asked uh, that a facility on the south side be included. Um, and so there was no question that the residents and the, uh, the, the, the facilities on the south side, at least one of them, uh, that serves as a library, be it, uh, be it the Horse Downing Branch, uh, should, should open or have something uh, at one of the other facilities so that residents, especially our children, our youth, can continue to engage uh, with, with learning and books. A lot of those residents use the library uh, to, to get on the internet because a lot of them don't have access to the internet and they, they frequent the library to, to search the web for jobs and for research and for other opportunities. So it's a, it's a, it is important. Yes, sir, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Go right on. Just said thank you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Mr. Binder. Um, Mr. Mayor, if, it, if, uh, if we can move forward, if there are no other questions about libraries, we move to uh, the Slover Library itself and Lynn Clements. Yes, thank you. 
Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and Mr. Benda. So you can see by the first slide here that uh, Slover Library has been open five years uh, this past January, and I'll be starting my fourth year in August, so it's been a great uh, pleasure for me to work with Team Norfolk and my dedicated staff at Slover. Slover Library serves as a vital and dynamic lighthouse of community lifelong learning, civic en engagement, and leading edge technology available to all citizens of the region. I call it a lighthouse because uh, we try things out, we kind of pilot the projects, and then uh, share them with other people to increase their learning as well. We are reimagining traditional library experiences by developing interdisciplinary spaces and cutting edge community-centered programs and services. Even with the reduction in our staff, we aim to take the library into the future as a regional asset for Hampton Roads and beyond. And uh, similar to the um, services that, Slo that uh, Sonal has outlined, uh, we have currently, while closed, offered online ebooks and, and the things that she was talking about to all of our uh, library card holders, so I won't go over that again. But we're also excelling in programming as we always have. We're using virtual classroom opportunities and we also have the Ask a Librarian services. Regarding reopening, um, Slover will pr provide a continuum of service according to health and safety guidelines as well. We are going to try offering the curbside book delivery when the staff returns and we're, and we're still closed. And then we'll go to a limited access to the library, what we call closed stacks. And uh, the people will be able to come in, the patrons will come in, and then uh, we'll uh, offer physical distancing. Uh, before we open up, we're going to have Dr. Lindsay's staff to come in and tour and give us advice on best practices. And as we begin to open, we're going to do a video walkthrough so everyone knows what to expect when they come approach the library. And of course, we'll be open fewer hours at first to allow for cleaning, and we have fewer staff. So on the next slide, you can see our um, array of programming. We really, I'll use that word pivot, we pivoted a lot uh, to virtual programming quickly. And we plan to continue to offer this format. Before we, uh, before pre-COVID, we offered about 800 programs a quarter. And so uh, we're really into programming. We think it makes a difference. And we are really using the online. You can see the number of participants up there. Miss Erin up in the top left-hand corner had 860 views of her program, her baby garden program. Now, that's making an impact in the community and beyond. Um, we never could get that many people into Slover, into our program room. Homeschoolers are also a core part of our programming audience, and our resources and techniques have been a model, once again a lighthouse, as I mentioned before, for alternative schooling while traditional schools have been closed. And of course, uh, we have story times, crafts, and book clubs for teens and adults. Uh, you can see all of the kind, this is kind of a, a sample of the programs that we're offering. In the next slide, you'll see, uh, I mentioned having a, a, a reach beyond uh, Slover. Uh, last year, we did have our NASA program, and uh, since we had that cool launch this weekend, I don't know if you were able to see the, the Dragon uh, SpaceX NASA launch. Um, uh, kind of space is kind of cool these days, and so I think you all remember Ms. Johnson came to our uh, NASA program where we had 225 kids in there and talking to the astronaut. What's really neat about it is now uh, we're being a lighthouse for the uh, nationally because our head librarian was invited by NASA and the Space Science Institute to present at the American Library Association National, National Virtual Conference in June. And so uh, this, this is going to be able to be shared with libraries across the country, how you work with a big company like NASA, a uh, big government agency, and make it come out so well as we did. On the next slide, we have, uh, let's see, that's where we have the little NASA thing there, um, where Miss Liz, our head librarian, is going to be in the conference. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we also have our, our Centers for Innovation and Engagement. We have two of those, and we're adding another one in the fall, a business center. The first one I want to talk to you then about is our creative studios, and I've got a sample up here from our sound studio, studios. 
While we've been closed, we've been doing virtual experiences here as well. We're starting to produce podcasts, and you can see our own sound library there up uh, listed. We've got our own little podcast library going. In the next slide, uh, we have been thrilled to have a second Center for Innovation and Engagement, our lifelong learning, and that's a council initiative that's very important to the community. And you will be briefed on this in more detail as it moves along. We hired Carrington Consulting. They're working on learning reimagined for Hampton Roads. And until they can get out into the community, they've been doing all sorts of productive work already. They've been researching existing resources. They're going to create an opportunity inventory on what's out in our community already on lifelong learning. They're doing some branding of the project and program. They're talking about course credentialing, where people would take programs and get um, credentials for that. And future funding is a concern. We want to make sure that someone wakes up every day in our community and says, OK, what am I going to do about lifelong learning and to keep it going after the year when the consultant is gone? And also, we'd like to apply for international certification next spring as a UNESCO lifelong learning city, perhaps the first in the country. Um, people are uh, looking at this across the country, but no one has actually achieved this yet. And I think that it's something that our community could do. Uh, we're going to try to have a post-COVID outreach at the waterfront with our partners to celebrate and roll out lifelong learning, so stay tuned for that. And then the newest uh, business center is the next thing I want to go to on the slide. I'm thrilled tonight to announce that we have uh, a new business center and we have gotten a sponsor for it. The sponsor is a businessman himself. His name is Roy E. Hendricks. He's donating money to get this going because he knows that after COVID, our businesses, it's just what you were talking about earlier. How do the businesses have resources that they need to get back on their feet? How can they learn from Grow with Google, which is our partner in this, uh, the whole business center? And so Mr. Hendricks is a uh, local property owner. He owns property in Norfolk and he manages property. He's a veteran, a retired civil service employee, an instructor, and a philanthropist. Thank goodness for his generosity at this time. He's going to help us provide specialized on online software and forms, books and materials, consultative services, uh, webinars and workshops, fax and notary services, flexible furnishings for co-working and independent work, laptops, and filming equipment for patron use in the library. We've got partners for this, and that in they include economic development, local workforce development initiatives, downtown Norfolk Council, many, many, many more businesses. So another lighthouse for learning reaching out across um, our whole community and into the region. And finally, my last slide shows uh, partners that we have, um, certainly many more than this, but this is kind of gives you a feel for the people who support Slover and make it happen. And I want to concentrate on the last one, which is our nonprofits that help us. This includes uh, the boards and the friends and the Slover Library Foundation. The, li the Slover Library Foundation supports learning through new and upgraded technology programming and collaborative partnerships, so we couldn't do it without any of our nonprofit support. So measuring success, number of workshops and participants, software usage, social media connections, surveys, online chat, questions, and comments. So we've got a plan going forward to be a lighthouse for the community learning, and we appreciate your support as we go forward. Thank you so much. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Two quick questions for Lynn. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I love the new business center. I think that's fabulous. It's, that is a, a home run. Um, one, could you explain a little bit more about the drive up service and how that's going to work? And number two, I've had a lot of questions from folks about the makerspace and how people could utilize and access that space to help with making PPE moving forward. 
Thank you, so Michelle. The, the curbside um, what is going to be when we're closed still, but the staff is back in the building. And so uh, we would uh, let people uh, check out books. We'd have them ready for them. They would kind of grab, uh, grab and go, like Sonal calls it, and uh, we would just have them already at the front outside on a table. And where I'm looking into trying to get a parking spot for them to pull up and park in, and then they just pop out of their car. There's no, uh, they've already checked out the books, so there's no, um, they're not getting in touch with any physical uh, means but with the staff. And the other question was about the Maker Studio. The Maker Studio was run by um, part-time staff. Uh, and they've all been furloughed and actually uh, separated from the city starting July 1. Uh, it was, so it was run by part-time and volunteers, and so uh, we'll have to get back up to speed on having someone to be able to um, operate that space. It's a very small space. It's meant to be consultative, not a production um, studio where you go into the uh, you go upstairs to the design studio, you design one item, and you come back down, and our staff helps you print it out. So um, at this point, uh, because of staff issues, staffing issues, and um, the small space, uh, we'll have to see what we do going forward. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. All right, Mr. Binda. All right, Mr. Mayor, um, finally this evening, uh, Mr. Crittenden will present to you a, a uh, plan for recreation parks and open space. I will say quickly, Mr. Mayor, um, Ms. Graves, uh, the good news is that uh, city staff did hear you, hear you. The bad news is I didn't remember. In this presentation, you'll hear that the Berkeley Rec Center is open. I think the opportunity for us is to uh, partner with libraries about a circulation for books. And with that, I'll turn it to Daryl Crittenden. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Deputy City Manager Benda. As you know, as we've gone through this pandemic, we continue to follow government, governor executive orders. Currently, we're following the orders of 6163, where we're maintaining physical distancing and also enforcing face masking. That's caused us to actually shape our programming, where we've gone from interior programming to exterior. And through many partnerships, can we can change that slide if you'd like to, sir. Um, through our many partnerships, we've been able to look at programming, and this started pre-COVID, where we've had a chance to sit down with Fest events and talk about the reprogramming of Town Point Park, Ocean View Park, our green spaces, our open spaces, cemeteries, and other public recreational green spaces. So we've come up with a series of programs. We've taken what used to be indoors is now virtual programming, and as we continue through this slide, um, we can skip the reopening expectations. We've already spoken about that. But we'll continue to enhance our virtual libraries. But I think the most important telling factor is, as we look at the continuum of services, the question is, what are we doing now? At this point in time, we're offering virtual classes. The ERT is open, where we've actually assisted with the Elizabeth River Trail Committee for recreation programs. We have exercise, fitness, beaches are open for exercise, fitness, and kayaking. Our facilities remain closed, though. As restrictions continue to relax, we can start looking at small group activities, making sure that we have the proper numbers, and something that Fest Events has done well is come up with a program for rings in our parks that can actually house four to five people and maintain the six foot distance that's required for physical distancing. We'll continue to work with programming with our partners and not only with fest events and libraries, Open Norfolk is actually looking at maybe some drive-in movies and a plethora of programs. When you look at performances, concerts, comedy shows, theaters, dance as performances, recreation components would be free throw challenges, you cannot have team sports because of the physical contact, but free throw challenges are allowed, putting competitions, beanbag, cornhole, and some family team competitions. Fitness, there's always Tai Chi in your parks, there's yoga in your parks, meditation, and Zumba. So with our partners and with being creative as parks and recreation professionals, 
we will take what we used to do indoors and move it outdoors. Next slide, please, Kim. If and when, as we continue to work through the health department and through the governor's restrictions, we will look at five recreation centers, as the city manager mentioned in his budget presentation, to open first, and those centers are Berkeley, Huntersville, Lambert Point, Norview, and East Ocean View Recreation Centers. Norfolk Fitness and Wellness Center is still under evaluation and is a consideration. But at this point in time, it would be Berkeley, Huntersville, Lambert Point, Norview, and East Ocean View Recreation Centers. An example of how we program out these centers with fewer centers, hours of operations would have to expand. And of course, we'd have Saturday hours, but we'd have to look at different age groups as to when they come into our facilities or utilize facilities. And this diagram, this slide right here, demonstrates how we program the different age groups in those centers. <coughs> Next slide, please. A couple examples on sample recreation programming since COVID-19 has actually come upon us is we have over 20 videos. We have over 20 virtual program offerings just for youth alone. Another 15 videos for adult programming and we have video, virtual programming for our special populations. One of the videos I was going to show tonight, but we're a little pressed on time, is our chalk art challenge. And that was amazing. It gives youth a chance to be creative, innovative, where a youth can go outside in front of their home and actually do chalk drawings on the sidewalk, take a picture, and actually shop it around and challenge somebody, a peer of their own age group, to see if they can come up with a better drawing. And so it's a competition citywide. So that's gone over pretty well. But those are just some of the small samples of some of the virtual classes and opportunities we provide for youth and will continue to provide. Next slide, please. So with that being said, our takeaways, first and foremost, we want to ensure the safety of Team Norfolk when opening facilities and ensure the safety of our patrons. We want to make sure that we plan a continuum of public facing services, meaning we want to interact with the public in a safe way and actually find venues that are safe for recreational opportunities. We want rapid, successful shift to virtual work environment. That has yielded a great deal of success for us with a lot of our admin staff telecommuting from home and working from home. And we want to make sure that our service delivery is popular and far reaching. And with the partners we have established through COVID-19, I think we will definitely be on that mission. Okay, Kim. That's my presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me any questions you may have. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. McClellan. Okay, I'm very concerned that Norfolk Fitness Wellness Center is not on this and other than it's just being considered. Um, I was told it was being going to open. I was also told by the staff and budget that the, the, the rec centers that were considered were just to be reopening only for staff purposes and not for actual programming. I, I, I don't understand. Anyway, I, I, I appreciate that we have budget constraints and I know that we can't do everything but I think it is very short-sighted not to uh, reopen Norfolk Fitness and Wellness Center as part of that first tranche, and I'm very concerned about the ability for Prime Plus to operate as well. So, Ms. Uh, Ms. McClellan, this is Mr. Mayor, may I address Ms. McClellan's Mr. point? Mr. Bender, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McClellan, this was a, a late addition uh, in talking to, um, to Dr. Filer. Um, in his conversation with you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where, where to look, honestly. Um, uh, part of the opportunity because the pool was closed it was re, uh, looking at the green space around it and also the space inside so it, it is a late addition to, to the include on this list here that the expectation is we will to the degree that we can leverage the space around it and also inside look to reopen nfwc so just just to confirm is that you are going to reopen it there's a lot of green space outside it's centrally located it's a huge space i just want to make sure that's are you committing to reopening that as part of those Additional five? Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Mr. Binder. I have something. Uh, uh, Ms. 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 Grace, go right on. So um, 
I, you guys didn't do this in map format, and maybe you can provide it where it shows, because I think it addresses what Mamie was asking about earlier when she mentioned Baron Black, she mentioned Park Place, and um, she mentioned the South Side. But I, I think what I'm seeing, and I may be wrong, um, because I don't have a map to actually um, look at it, but that there's a balance between, or are you go, are it, is what you're going for a balance between the libraries that may be open in some areas and recreation centers that may be open in other areas yeah, so that there is something open throughout the city? And then the second question that I have is in those areas where the recreation center is open, and the library branch is not open, is it possible for us to coordinate once or twice a day or some sort of hours, like 12 to two or whatever, for um, book pick up and drop off? So somebody could reserve a book online to be picked up at a rec center that's gonna be open and because all the books are coming back to Pinewell, then that should be an easy distribution point to those rec centers that are actually open. Mr. Mayor, may I respond? Yes, Mr. Binder. Ms. Craves, uh, yes and yes to your questions. Yes, if you recall the presentation that we gave uh, uh, during the retreat that showed resources and where and usage, what we tried to do was um, to uh, create a certain parity with the resources that we were opening as far as libraries and rec centers to create opportunities in niche. And what you've uh, proposed as far as an opportunity, yes, we can look at leveraging, like what we said with Berkeley Recreational Center as an opportunity for library components out of it. So yes and yes to your, uh, to your questions. And I may have missed it. There's gonna be Wi-Fi at the, li at the rec centers as well, where people no, can no, park no, no. and internet, if you will. So or can Ms. we do that? Ms. Doyle and, and Ms. McClellan and several of you have raised that as an opportunity, and that's our intent. Um, whether or not we're successful, I, I think you saw the, saw the, showed the graph, um, I think it was Pete, and uh, I know that we're giving praise to many people, but if I don't say something about IT and Fraser Picard and what they've done to kind of really get us in a spot where we can telework, um, I'd be remiss. So I, I think that the opportunity is <laughs> there, and whether or not we will be successful, I hope we will. Great. Great, thank you. I know this has been hard and I know it's been a lot and it's combined with a lack of financial resources to do everything that we you know, would like to do. But um, thank you all for the work that you have done and all of the thought that has gone into it and, and making sure that there are some services that are available for our city, for our citizens in every area of the city. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Smiko. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank staff. It's uh, 830, 840, and I appreciate our staff staying so late during this time, but don't blame me. Um, I did not set the agenda, so uh, I, I, we crammed a lot into this. Um, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, you guys set the agenda, right? So we can blame you. <laughs> um, Daryl. You there still Daryl? Yes, sir. I'm here. Thank you for your presentation and for working on that. Um, I assume that um, you did not have the governor's newest announcement today when you guys created that um, agenda, your presentation. Uh, no, sir. We did not. Just found out today. Okay. So I, I just I think this would be helpful for council maybe at our next meeting. I think the governor surprised everybody today by coming out with phase two um, for this Friday. I think a lot of people were expecting that to happen a little bit later in June 10th. And um, Daryl, I'm looking at it right now online and they are allowing recreational sports now. And, and the governor's also allowing for recreation centers to be reopened with obviously limitations to both of those. I think Mr. Mayor, what would be helpful We've got to find some way to separate um, the financial issue that is causing the constraints within our centers and our libraries versus the governor's order and what was separating. Because 
when we were going through the budget process, the city manager said to us, a lot of these won't be able to open up till July or later when the governor's order, you know, um, is extended. But now as I'm finding, I'm reading this, the governor's actually opening up stuff now, um, this Friday. And so if it is a budget constraint that is causing um, us to be able to not have some of these services, I would like for that to be separated from the governor's order. So if other rec centers can now open because the governor is allowing that and we can afford to do it in our budget, then we have to start over, unfortunately, and, and we look at, at, at the plan. And I feel for our staff because they, nobody knew this was gonna come. I mean, we've, we haven't known a lot of the things the governor is gonna announce until he gets up in front of the press conference and does it. And that's been a big issue. We don't know these things. So I, I'm hopeful that in the next meeting, maybe the city manager can pick this apart winter and help us with understanding what is a budget constraint and what is a actual governor's order. We're not doing it. We're the city managers choosing not to do this right now to protect our employees. I think that would just be extremely helpful in understanding all of this. Thank you, Mr. Smeagol. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, yes, yes, we can absolutely do that. You're, you meet again on June 9th. Um, there's not, uh, and I think June 23rd. So June 9th, we can we can get you some kind of material in advance, or maybe even at the meeting, depending. Mr. Mayor, yes, go right on. Um, thank you, Mr. Crittenden. Thank you, Team Norfolk, for all of the presentations um, tonight. Most appreciative. Thanks to all of my colleagues. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, Mr. Bender, does that does that in, includes the agenda? Yes, sir, it does. Well, thank you. Let me uh, want to thank uh, staff and all the participants and uh, members of the council uh, for staying late and for dallying in. So uh, this meeting is. No, 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 Wait, no, no, no. Mr. Mayor, there's uh, one more piece of uh, business that uh, the, the the clerk is uh, motioning in a very uh, fur, uh, hurried fashion. Mr. Mr. Bull, I'm sorry. No problem. You know, virtual things happen like this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is in reference to a Second Amendment petition presented here with, in this package, for your consideration, it's a petition submitted by Mr. Robert Brown on behalf of the Norfolk Second Amendment Preservation Coalition, Coal 